unaccompanied Jewish children travelled to Britain from Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland and the Netherlands and were rehomed by British citizens. One of the 669 children who travelled from Prague to Britain was Lord Alf Dubbs. Lord Dubbs has been a long-standing servant of the Labour movement, serving as MP from Battersea from 1979 to 1987. His relentless campaigning work, both at the Refugee Council and in the House of Lords, to secure a safe passage for unaccompanied refugee children to Britain has been inspirational. Now we will watch a refugee's poem, a poem by Jasmine Thomas, age 11, from Liverpool, before hearing from Lord Alf Dubbs. How would you feel leaving all your loved ones, leaving all your friends and trying to find new ones? They're not just refugees, they are human too. They have a heart, they have a brain, they're just like me and you. I know you're like, I would never, but I'm looking at you most of all. You're the one who can make a difference, pick them up when they fall. You pick on them, make fun of them and pull them to the ground. I think, what have they done? They come here trying to find smiles, but not any fun. Imagine not having a choice, forced to leave your home. They don't understand what you're saying, then you leave them alone. They might hide the tears, fears and pain, and you think it's all right, but as soon as they go to their house, they're crying again at night. They have emotions and a life, it's already bad as it is. They or I don't need you to be telling them how to live. Welcome them in, let them play, compliment them every day. Tell them if people are mean, ignore what they say. Imagine spending ages to learn another speech. When they're made fun of, it's like they're drowning with no one to reach. It's hard to make friends, especially when they don't understand. They want company, they want smiles, they want a helping hand. They've seen bombs, blood and bodies scattered all around. They'll remember the horrible shrieks and that awful sound. Your life is great, isn't it? Theirs was two before they came. Imagine your mum screaming in fear, telling you to run while screaming in pain. Bye bye uncle, bye bye auntie, bye bye grandma too. Imagine those three last words, we'll miss you. Most times in the scariest times, it's hard to say goodbye. As they try to say that word, a tear escapes their eye. I don't know about you, but that's a lot to go through. So you may think you're stronger than them, I think they're stronger than you. If you're alone, I'll be your shadow. If you want to cry, I'll be your pillow. If you want a hug, I'll be your shoulder. If you need to be happy, I'll be the smile you've hidden. But anytime you need a friend, I'll just be me. Conference. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me, and I'm delighted that I'm preceded by that lovely poem. As you've heard, uh, 
This is the 80th anniversary of the Kindertransport uh, next month in November. And 10,000 uh, children, mainly Jewish, came from Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and some other countries. And I was one of them. And the person who organized the Kindertransport from Prague was Nicky Winton, a man who died at the age of 106, a great man. Uh, what you may not know is that although he was a constituent of Theresa Mays, he in fact stood as a Labour candidate for Maidenhead District Council in 1954 and 55, and he was great friends with Nye Bevan and other people. So I loved talking to him. He was a great guy and he loved talking politics. But above all, he did something fantastic. He needn't have bothered, and he decided that something had to be done. Other people would have walked away, and he did it. And so I owe my life to him, as do many others. Now, I should just explain that English is my third language. That's my excuse for what you're about to hear now. Um, look, um, early in 2016, Save the Children estimated that there were 95,000 unaccompanied child refugees somewhere in Europe, and that between five and 10,000 of them had in fact gone missing. So when the immigration bill was coming through the Lords, it seemed a good opportunity to put down an amendment and to establish that we should take some of these children. Uh, then I'll tell you one or two things that happened. I put the amendment down, and the next thing is Theresa May, who was Home Secretary, asked me to go and see her. Well, that's unusual. I'm only a backbench person in the Lords. Anyway, so she said she'd like me to withdraw the amendment. And I said, why? And she said, well, if we take these children, others will follow. And I said, but we can't. We can't turn our back on, uh, on these children, the dire conditions they're living in. It's awful. Uh, and anyway, it was no deal. So we left it, we left it at that. And then, um, and then the amendment, um, it, it went through the Lords easily. It was then slightly defeated in the Commons. It went back to the Lords with an even bigger majority. Now, something interesting happened at that time and that is public opinion began to be aware of the issue. One could sense public opinion. I was walking down the street in Hammersmith and somebody shouted at me. And normally when people shout at politicians, it's abuse. Oh no, keep on with the amendment, she said. So I was much encouraged by the supportive messages, but above all, by the fact that all over the country, support groups were being set up for refugees uh, to, bring them, to make them welcome. We saw on our television sets a little boy, Alan Kurdi, dying on a Mediterranean beach. And I think public opinion was shocked, and public opinion said we should do something. So Theresa May asked me to go and see her again. It was becoming a habit. Uh, she, was still home, she was still Home Secretary. And, and uh, she, then, she looked at me and she said, we propose to accept your amendment. And I said, great. Um, and then another minister told me, he said to me emphatically, we, we propose to accept the letter and the spirit of the amendment. And it is my contention the government have done no such thing. They've backed off whenever they could. For example, you know, I, I, people said to me, how do I feel? I said, I said, I vary between anger and tears about all this. It's bitterly, bitterly disappointing. Anyway, so the government uh, tried to limit the numbers. Originally, the amendment had said 3,000, but for complicated parliamentary reasons, we had to drop the 3,000 figure. Anyway, so the government then said, we propose to limit the numbers to 480. We said, why? Well, they said local authorities can't take, um, can't take any more children in foster places. So we said, well, this is ridiculous. We know lots of local authorities. I could go through a list, Hammersmith, Hammersmith Ealing, Lambeth, all sorts of local authorities who are able and willing to take more children. And we said that to the government. And you know, it's been a long time since that amendment was passed. And so far, we've had about 220 only. I mean, these are derisory sums, derisory numbers. Uh, you know, and, and it, is, it is really very disappointing. However, we've got another another legal path to safety. And the argument all along has been that if we don't give young people a legal path to safety, then the traffickers will get hold of them. And the traffickers can be dangerous, abusive, and horrible. And the thing is to find legal paths. Now, under, the, uh, under a Dublin treaty under the EU, there is something called Dublin III, which is basically to do with family reunion, which says essentially that, say, a Syrian boy in France could join an uncle in Sweden. And 
the campaign on behalf of the ones who didn't have family here under my amendment also became part of the campaign for the others. And so far, under that, we've had about 800. We estimate that there are so far uh, probably 2,000 in Greece eligible and 200 in France. They're eligible, they have the right to come here, and the government is still dragging their heels. And I think it is, it is, it is really very depressing. Now, in the middle of all this, uh, I, went, I had a chance to go to Calais, to the jungle twice, and once after it was pulled down. And when I first got to the jungle in Calais, some of you may have been there, some of you will have seen it on, on the television screens. When I, when I first got there, the, a bit of the camp had already been cleared. And in this little shopping street there was, there were displays of tear gas canisters and rubber bullets. And I said, what are they for? And the answer was that the French government was, the then French government had been worried about the National Front in that part of France near Calais. And they decided to move these refugees, many children among them, and they were using tear gas and rubber bullets because they were worried about the National Front being strong in that part of France. To which the only comment can be, you do not defeat the National Front by adopting the policies that they would adopt. And that, of course, is a wider lesson than just for, for refugees, but it, 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 definitely, apply, it definitely applies there. Uh, I, I then got to Calais again once or twice, and I saw some wonderful, wonderful people working with refugees. You know, there was a, there was a woman called Liz Clegg, who was actually a, a firefighter from Birmingham, who ran a mother and child center in the middle of the jungle. Tremendous people volunteering, most of them were pretty young, volunteering to help. And I think as a country, we should acknowledge that we've got lots of young people who've gone to the refugee camps to work with the most vulnerable of, of, of fellow human beings, child refugees, to give everything they can and to do it for virtually no money. I think that's terrific. Um, and then the camp was cleared in Calais, and we made desperate efforts with NGOs to bring as many children over as possible, but it didn't really work, and some of them were dispersed over France, and some of them are still um, worked their way back to the Channel. Now, in Greece, I also had a chance to go to the camps. The first time I went to the camps in Greece, it was middle of winter, the temperature was minus 12, it was bitterly cold, there was no heating. The situation was absolutely desperate. And what can you say to people? Uh, what can you say to people where there is no hope for them at all, except to say, well, we'll do our best to persuade the British government to do something? You know, uh, that was about the only hope, only hope we could offer. Uh, and of course we did. Uh, but it was very, 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 de very, very depressing. And just recently, I went to uh, three camps, including Moria camp on the island of Lesbos. And there were about 9,000 9, people in a camp for 2,000 and there was an adjacent camp which was not really a camp at all. These are desperate situations. And what can we say to people? There's no future for you. There's nothing, we, we, we've got nothing to offer you as, as, a, as a rich West European country. Surely, surely we can, do, we can do better than that. Now, so I've worked very hard with Safe Passage and, and Help Refugees and other NGOs who are doing magnificent work, mobilizing volunteers, as I have said. Now, the government has a small scheme uh, for vulnerable persons, including some vulnerable children uh, from the region, from, from Jordan, uh, uh, Lebanon, and so on. Uh, and the government scheme was there would be a total of 20,000 over five years, or 23,000, I should say, over five years. Now, so far, uh, about under, under half have come. And again, these are people, we've made a commitment, and yet we're not doing it. We're not doing very much, very much about it. And I, I just think we've got to do better than that, as I shall go on to say in, in, in a minute or two. Now, uh, Labour Party policy is pretty good. I want to nudge it a bit further, Jeremy, if you don't mind. Uh, I don't know, I don't know I'm, allowed to make, I'm allowed to make party policy up here. <laughs> well. Well, I have to say, in the light of that, I'm going to step it up a bit. <laughs> God, no, nobody's ever... I, I didn't know I could do it at a conference, just do it on the hoof. Anyway, there, there we are. <laughs> well, this is great. I'm going to have real fun here. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> anyway. so, I mean, Labour Party policy is, is, is good. We have, we have a commitment that refugees are the victims of war, persecution, famine, and so on. They're entitled to our support. The government 
a Labour government would continue with the amendment uh, uh, that, that I moved to, for unaccompanied child refugees to come here, that we'll be good on family reunion, and we'll do more for education. Now, we've always been an internationalist party, and Jeremy, you've spent your life being an internationalist. No, nobody, nobody can... Uh, no, nobody, nobody, no, nobody could didn't deny you that. It's well known and, and acknowledged. Now, um, we've, I, made, I, I explained some of the commitments that we have as a party, but I will be working with NGOs, and what we'd really like, it's, it's very simple. It's so modest, I, I think it's almost, almost not enough. But what we'd like is, is for a Labour government, I mean, Tory government, if they'll do it, but they won't. Is Labour, uh, 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 well, you know, I uh, can be optimistic. Anyway, anyway, uh, uh, a Labour, Labour government, I think we should make a commitment that 10,000 unaccompanied child refugees should be brought over to Britain from Europe and from the region. <laughs> I, 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 I'm being very modest. Uh, over a five-year period, and you know that is three per local authority per year. That's not very much, is it? It's almost too little. You can throw me off the platform for being too modest. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, more. Well, that's, uh, well, I agree. More, Jeremy. They say more. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it, it's a. Uh, you know, it is actually shameful that such modest requests are ones that no British government under the Tories can achieve or is willing to achieve. I think it is shameful and, and, and I think we need to be absolutely resolute. Now, just, just a little bit more, if I may. Uh, I, I also, I, I don't say that every unaccompanied child refugee in Europe is responsible to the British government. We should play our part, but all European countries should share responsibility. One or two have done. We're certainly way below what we should be doing, and we should stand firmly and say, this is what we're going to do. Now, let's look at, let's look at the global position. There are uh, 25 million refugees estimated in the world as a whole. There are 40 million displaced persons internally. That's to say people who fled from one part of the country to another who are as vulnerable as, as refugees, but they don't get international protection. And what is equally alarming is that half that 65 million figure is estimated to be children. Now, they need help, and so we have to speak out on the international stage as well as on the more local European stage. Now, you, a lot of these people have forgotten. We get a bit of news about what's happening in, in the Rohingyas in Bangladesh who fled Myanmar. Terrible situation. It's been going on for years. About 20 years ago, I saw about 100,000 who'd fled or been persecuted out of Myanmar. And now the number is seven, 800,000 or more. It's a desperate, desperate, situ desperate situation. And, and I, I think we, we, we can do better. And of course, for all the refugees in the world, these children, the majority, many of them, millions of them, don't have any education at all. Think of it, young people, no chance of education. So even if eventually they find safety somewhere, and many of these probably won't, it's terrible. They've missed out on education, they've missed out on their whole lives, on, 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 their, whole, on their whole futures. So it's absolutely crucial that we support education, both for refugees who have arrived here, so they get a good chance to learn English and catch up, uh, but also for refugee, refugees the world over. Now, I have, I have just uh, uh, two or three little asks of you because you wouldn't go, want to go away. We were being asked to do something, uh, you know, more to life than a party conference. So, uh, so look, look uh, let me put it this way. Uh, I would vouch that every Labour MP would be pretty, pretty good on this and would be very committed. The ones I've talked to, many of them certainly are. But, you know, some of you may suffer from MPs from another party. And I think... Could you possibly bear to contact your MP, your Tory MP, and ask them to, to, to do more for child refugees, to ask them not to have a cap of 480? <laughs> After all, somebody in their constituencies voted for them, and it is right there should be pressure on them. And in my experience, pressure might just help a bit. Now, what about local councils? Uh, could you also 
Well, if you're a local councillor, take the message with you and push. Look, if your council's doing a good job, pat yourselves on the back and that's great. If your council is not doing a good job, and I can mention some that aren't, like Wandsworth, for example. Um, I could mention others, but anyway, Wandsworth. Um, <laughs> my foot, my foot. Uh, uh, ask, um, ask, um, ask your local council what they're doing. Put some pressure on them. Put pressure on them so that they should do more to help all refugees, including child refugees. And that's a big ask, and you're all going to go and do it. Uh, and, and more power to your persuasive policy. Look, if you don't like your MP, hold your nose, but go and see them anyway. Right. <laughs> and finally, can I just say this? Uh, I came as an unaccompanied child refugee, and this country and the Labour Party have given me most fantastic of opportunities. I've had real opportunities which I never dreamed would be possible to a refugee coming to Britain at the age of six. And I would like to feel... Well, thank you. I, I, I would like to feel the child refugees coming to Britain now, and the more that will follow under, under Jeremy's government, the child refugees will be as made to feel as welcome here and be given the same opportunities that I have. Conference. Our debate this afternoon is on security at home and abroad. In this debate, we will be talking about how the Tories are cutting the police while violent crime soars. You can't keep people safe on the cheap. Labour will invest in protecting people and end the bomb first, think later approach to foreign policy with a new approach based on human rights. Conference. We will be taking a number of items this afternoon, including the contemporary composites on justice for Windrush and Palestine. The main, policy commission, the main policy commission reports we are considering are justice and home affairs on pages 99 to 118 of the National Policy Forum report and international on pages 83 to 97 of the MPF report. We've also been notified of a proposal to refer back a section of the National Policy Forum report. Conference, we had limited time this morning for floor speakers and several people were unable to be called. As this afternoon's debate includes the International Policy Forum report, then any contributions on the debate on Brexit issues are obviously appropriate. We'll, carry, we'll be taking these motions first and then we'll hear from Emily Thornbury once they have been moved. Contemporary Composites. First, we'll take the Contemporary Composite 8 on Justice for Windrush to be moved by Lewisham, Dep Lewisham Deptford CLP. And could West Ham CLP be ready to second? Sophia Mangara, first time delegate and speaker. <laughs> Lewisham and Deptford CLP, one of the most ethnically diverse constituencies in the UK. We are standing here to, today with our Windrush generations and all affected by the tourist, racist, hostile environment policy. As a South African anti-apartheid activist and a lifelong anti-racist campaigner, I know the struggle is urgent. We don't, we don't know how many thousands of Windrush and other Commonwealth citizens who were invited here to rebuild this country are, are um, victims of this racist policy, immigration policy. Many have lost their jobs, their homes, their pensions, 
and access to NHS services and, and other, other services. Some were deported. Sajid Javid has broken his promise. He announced a few days ago that those entitled to citizenship will be deported if a crime is committed. This is modern day transportation and we must not accept it. Thank you. Some victims have died as a result of this hostile environment. Today we remember Dexter Bristol and most recently our sister Sarah O'Connor, a Windrush victim and a campaigner. Both died before they got justice. This hostile environment must be abolished and the time is now. May and Jarvid want to create a, a pound shop compensation for victims. This further undermines our value and our contributions to British society. Victims must be fully co uh, compensated, including for pain and suffering. Hardship payments must be given immediately. We say end to detention, end all deportations, end policies of destitution. We call on the next Labour government uh, to scrap all racist immigration laws, such as the 2014 Immigration Act, as our Shadow Home Secretary, Diane Abbott, has pledged. <laughs> Women have led protests in detention to expose ill treatment, appalling conditions, and racist sexual harassment forced on hunger strike there have been seven in the last 10 years, and it's not good enough. We must stop and, and, and all detention. That's why we are calling for an end to all immigration detention centers. This host <laughs> This hostile environment dehumanizes us all. Those affected are our friends, our neighbours, our loved ones, our communities. Our contribution as black and migrant people goes back centuries, from slavery up until today. We believe that we have a right to stay, a right to dignity, and a right to justice, now, not tomorrow. <laughs> Let's do this for our sister Sarah, and Dexter and all those deprived of their rights. Let's stand up together with our leader, Jeremy Corbyn, against all forms of racism, including Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. <laughs> Labour is the anti-racist party and don't let anyone say anything else. I, I call on the chair to call as many BME delegates to speak to this motion. They are lining up there, out there, and they want to speak and have their voices heard. And please do um, make this, uh, make this um, your mission. Thank you, conference. Thank you, conference. I move this motion. Please support it. Solidarity forever with Winrush. Tina Jess, West Ham, CLP. We second this motion, calling on a Labour government to end the hostile environment and close down all detention centres. <laughs> Yarlswood survivor Pauline explains. I was taken in a secure van and told I was going to be sent out of the country. I couldn't eat or sleep. Still now, I can't eat or sleep properly. 
I was allowed to call my daughter when staff took me to a removal centre. She screamed in terror down the phone. I was panicking because that evening they took away a woman. I watched her crying, being taken away. It was very scary. They had tickets for me. I thought I was going. I was resigned because I couldn't fight anymore. I just gave up. And Mr. Bryan explained to officials who came to detain him at his home that he'd lived in the UK most of his life, adding, but to them, I was lying. Everything I was telling them. Mr. Bryan agreed that race was a part of it. He said, when asked in the Home Office, yes. Many people in detention centres are from Commonwealth countries. Some from the Caribbean who have a right to stay had to claim asylum because they were denied their rights. The, holistic, the hostile environment is not just against the Windrush generation, it is against all of us. It scapegoats and dehumanises people. We must come together to fight it. The Windrush scandal simply exposes the creeping in of the hostile environment in Tory Britain. The UK are the only country in Europe to detain people indefinitely under immigration laws. The, Tories, the Tory Home Secretary's current Windrush task force is woeful, shocking and discriminatory. As Diane Abbott has said, the Windrush generation should be treated as any other British citizens. Instead, even now, they are not being supported. Mr Javid, son of an immigrant bus driver, if you make a genuine error with your expenses, you would not be deported. Why should those of the Windrush generation have different rules? I am proud to stand beside all the hard-working black activists who do so much of the work on this. West Ham are proud to second this motion. West Ham are proud internationalists. Windrush, we are with you. Thank you. Next contemporary conversation nine on Palestine to be moved by Harlow CLP and could Wolverhampton South West CLP be ready to second? Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Colin Monaghan, Harlow delegate, First time delegate, first time speaker. Today it is my honour and my privilege to speak on behalf of the Palestinian people. During the course of the debate, I want you to use your imagination. Right now, two babies are being born in Jerusalem. One to Palestinian parents, the other to Israeli parents. Those babies don't know that they are Palestinian and Israeli. They had no part creating the problems of the world they have been born into, and they have no knowledge of the tragedies that have gone before. They will both bring love into their parents' hearts like nothing they have ever known. And for the next 10 to 12 weeks, they will both rob their parents of sleep, leaving their parents more tired than they thought possible. A, tired, a tiredness that every parent remembers all too well. Throughout this debate, I want you to remember those two babies, small, precious, innocent. I want you to realise that this motion is about wanting those babies to have a better future 
than the futures filled with pain, suffering and hatred. Let's put their futures on a different trajectory to the one that's been mapped out for them. But for that to happen, for there to be a joint future for the next generation, there has to be an acceptance of the tragedies of the past. In 1948, the Palestinian people suffered the tragedy of the Nakba, when the majority of Palestinian people were forcibly displaced from their homes. There are those that are nervous about the word Nakba, but the Nakba did happen and those people were forcibly removed from their homes. And there has to be a recognition of that for those two babies to have a future together. That tragedy that the Palestinians suffered cannot be written out of history, it cannot be downplayed, and it must not be ignored. Conference, we cannot be silent on this. Being silent might be the easy thing to do, but it's not the right thing to do. As socialists, we are rightly proud of the achievements of the Attlee government of the late 40s, the creation of the NHS and the welfare state. But conference, this tragedy happened on our watch. We were there. We saw it unfold. And for that reason, we cannot close our eyes or turn away. Our movement has a proud history of standing up for the oppressed. And that tradition must continue. Not because it's the easy thing to do, but because it's the right thing to do. I grew up in the east end of London, in a little place called Wapping. My nan, thank you. <laughs> My nan lived up the road in Stepney, in a street called Cable Street. Oh, you've heard of it? I'm glad. I learned to ride my bike on that street. <laughs> in 1936, members of my family, along with thousands of other EastEnders, trade unionists, and members of the labour movement, stood on the barricades and in front of police on horseback. Not because it was the easy thing to do, but because it was the right thing to do. Conference, if we are silent, we are complicit. The tragedy that the Palestinian people suffered is not just some footnote in history. It is real. It goes on till this day. That must be recognised. The Palestinian people cannot be left alone in the darkness. Their story must be told. A wise man once said, it is better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. Conference, I want you to light a candle today a candle so bright that they can see it from here to Washington. I want us to send a message to Mr Trump that cutting the funding to the UNRWA, the humanitarian agency set up by the UN to assist these people in exile, born homeless, born stateless, in refugee camps, will not crush their spirit. It will not lessen their resolve to return home. Expelling Palestinian diplomats will not make them disappear like a snowflake in the hot sun. We see that you seek to push the Palestinian people and the truth of their tragedy into the darkness. And I want us to say with one voice that we will not let the tragedies of the Palestinian people go quietly into the, into the night. We will rage. We will rage against the dying of the light. Not because it's the easy thing to do, but because it's the right thing to do. Delegate your time's up, I'm sorry. Thank My you time's not up. I'm speaking for the Palestinian people. I've got a couple more lines and I'm going to say them. And if you want me off this stage, you're going to have to get security up here. Wait, and they worry. better send an army, because EastEnders, like Palestinians, don't go down easy.
And I'll leave you on this. Keep in mind those two babies. They deserve a better future than the one mapped out for them. I want us to say this to every Palestinian. We have heard you calling from the darkness and we cannot and we will not ignore you or your tragedy. Brothers, sisters, conference, I'll move. Hold on a second, we can't proceed until we have everyone sat down. I just, I'll take you in just a second, sir. I just want to remind everyone, we're not here to cut you off because we don't want people to participate in a debate. It's so that we can have maximum participation. It's not about shutting anyone down, it's just to be inclusive. I remind people that if you're moving a motion, you've got five minutes, you've got three minutes to second, and other speeches from the floor are three minutes. Um, I'm going to take point of order. Yeah, I'm going to take this point of order first. So if the delegate would, who's seconding would mind just stepping aside for a second. Thank you. Paul Wilkinson, Gedling CLP. This morning, a colleague and I unfurled an EU flag. We were told in no uncertain terms by the stewards to take it down. There are double standards here because we've seen banners all over the place. Thanks, Delegate. When we get onto the main debate from the floor, we'll be ensuring that everyone puts up their hands, just, the, just their hands, and stays seating. But I'm now I'm going to invite the Delegate to second okay. the motion. Thank you. Chair, conference. Zahid Ali, Wolverhampton South West CLP. I'd like to second Composite 9. For those of you unaware, my constituency, Wolverhampton South West, it was the constituency 50 years ago represented by Enoch Powell when he made his Rivers of Blood speech. Now, 50 years later, it's represented by a black female Labour MP. Do I get extra time? <laughs> the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And that gives us hope in the Palestinian activist movement and the Palestinian solidarity movement. Eleanor is a nurse, but I doubt in her career that on the mean streets of the Midlands, she ever had to face being shot at by a professional trained army sniper. Unfortunately, that is the face that befell Razan al najjar a young female Palestinian medic who was shot dead during the march of return. Razan will not be forgotten. We will remember her in our hearts and in our actions. But she was just one of many hundreds killed and many thousands injured, including children, medics and journalists. Six weeks ago, on Friday the 10th of August, a volunteer Palestinian medic, Abdullah al Qatati, 22 years old, was shot by an Israeli sniper while treating another man's bullet wounds. Abdullah was less than a year away from completing his psychology degree. Both he and his patient, Ali Said al -Aboud, died from their wounds. One week later, on Friday the 17th of August, another um, Palestinian, Karim Ahmed Ali Fateh, was fatally shot in the head when Israeli soldiers opened fire 
on unarmed protesters near the Gaza boundary fence. More than 100 others were shot with live ammunition on that day alone. The, the Great Return March is a broad-based and popular protest by the Palestinians in order to make their voices heard. They are willing to die to be heard. Conference, we want to send them this message that we hear them. When an Israeli government spokesperson was asked, why are unarmed protesters being targeted? She responded, we can't put them all in jail. Conference, the reality is that Gaza is an open air jail. The illegal siege and blockade must be lifted. Delegate, can you start wrapping up, please? The Israeli military can do this with impunity only if we remain silent. We must stand with the Palestinian people, not least because our own government is complicit when it sells arms to Israel, including sniper rifles, like those used to shoot Abdullah and Karim. Join us in the call for an international investigation into Israel's use of force against Palestinian demonstrators and for arms sales to Israel to be frozen. We must stand shoulder to shoulder with the international community and the Palestinian people in calling for an immediate, unconditional end to the heartbreaking blockade of Gaza, which is aiming to destroy Palestinians. I second the motion. Okay, we have limited time throughout the afternoon, so I'm going to bring us back to a procedural point quickly. We're going to hear from Emily Thornbury and then we'll go on to the, the main debate. Again, throughout the debate, I will say that we, we won't, we'll lose time if we have people standing up and chanting at the end of every speech. It won't be sustainable. We're going to try and fix that um, sooner rather than later. Um, but for now, we're going to consider ref a reference back which has been notified to the CAC. It is in the name of Beckenham CLP who wish to move reference back of the section of the Justice and Home Affairs Policy Commission report on electoral and constitutional reform on page 117. The fifth sentence beginning, the Commission also received submissions and concluding at the expense of backbenchers, could I ask the delegate from Beckenham to come forward? You have one minute. Once the same uh, good spoke. afternoon, conference. Dermot McKibben, Beckenham CLP, and also first timer. I'm moving back the reference in the NPF report because it only mentions voter identification. And what I'm asking for is a proper strategy to deal with voter ID. Um, uh, in my borough, Bromley, we were a pilot borough where you had to show voter identification in the recent local elections. 154 voters were turned away without the required ID. And Labour lost a one seat by 40 votes. The Tories claim the voter ID is to deal with electoral fraud. There's never been any electoral fraud in Bromley. The Tories want to roll out this scheme nationally. We all know this is an attack on the voting rights of low income people. This is the British equivalent of American Jim Crow legislation. Conference, we need a proper strategy to deal with this. I move reference Thank back. Thank you. Thank you. Conference, I am now pleased to introduce the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Emily Thornbury. I'm losing my voice a bit. I've done 12 speeches already. I really don't want any further Theresa May moments. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Chair, conference, it's a privilege to be at the opening of this debate. On behalf of my good friends, Nia Griffith and Kate Ossimore, their shadow teams, including Liverpool's very own Dan Carden, and my own superb ministerial team, Helen Goodman, Liz McInnes, Khaled Mahmood, Fabian Hamilton, Ray Collins, and my PPS, Danielle Rowley, a fabulous representative of the resurgent Scottish Labour Party. <laughs> and it's wonderful to be back in Liverpool, isn't it? A city that we really didn't think could get any more Labour. And where last year we won 37,000 more votes than in 2015. Uh, our biggest ever vote in this city. And next time round, under the inspirational leadership of Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald, we're going to go one better. It's been 35 years since we kicked the last Tory MP out of Liverpool. So next time round, we'll win Southport as well, and we'll kick the Tories out of Merseyside for good. At conference, we all know that this is a year of important anniversaries in the history of our socialist movement, a movement that has always been based on the unstoppable momentum of the masses, the incredible inspiration of courageous individuals, and a core belief, a core belief that injustice done to any of us is injustice done to all of us, wherever we are in the world. And this year of anniversaries, we start by celebrating 150 years of the TUC. 150 years spent fighting for workers, not just in Britain, but across the globe, and stronger than ever today, thanks to the leadership of Francis O'Grady. And thanks to the Labour leadership, which now respects the representatives of our workers, rather than treating them with deliberate contempt. And in this year of anniversaries conference, let's recall, it's 130 years ago since a thin, humble, bearded socialist. <laughs> it's funny how those men can change the world, isn't it? A Frenchman called Pierre de Gaeta sat down and wrote a new melody for some old lyrics and created the song that we now know as the International which inspires the working class of Europe and shook the ruling class because it rejected war, rejected exploitation, and urged the human race to unite. And of course, conference, it's 100 years since the first women of our country won the right to vote and won the right to stand for Parliament. Now, don't let anybody ever say that we were given those rights, girls, because the women who came before us weren't given anything. They fought for those rights, they suffered for those rights, and some of them died for those rights, and everything that we now enjoy was, was won for us by those brave and brilliant women. But, but, it's also been a 100 years conference since a young woman who never got the right to vote gave birth to her only son, a son who was refused permission to attend her funeral 50 years later because he was in a prison cell on Robben Island. Nosekena Mandela never got to see her son freed. She never got to see him change his country and inspire the world, but he called her the center of his universe, so we owe it to her that he did. And conference, we also celebrate this year the anniversaries of some of Labour's greatest achievements. 70 years since the Attlee government created the NHS, 50 years since the Wilson government helped create the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and 20 years conference since Gordon Brown brought in the tax credits which the Tories are trying to dismantle. 20 years since, since Tony Blair secured the Good Friday Agreement, which the Tories are trying to jeopardise, and 20 years since the Labour government declared the devolution revolution, which the Tories are trying to ignore, as they hurtle towards a false choice between the Chequers deal and no deal, either one of which will kill jobs and growth all across the country, and neither one of which we will ever accept.
But conference, it's also a year of solemn anniversaries. A hundred years since the end of the First World War, when young men from every corner of the human race united across Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, not in the spirit of the international, but in the words of Keir Hardy, to fill the horrid graves of war in the name of selfish and incompetent statesmen who had failed to preserve the peace. And it's 70 years to conference since the assassination of Gandhi, and 50 years since Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, three men of peace, three men of hope, all shot dead because they believed in an alternative to violence and hatred and war. And there's a final anniversary that I think we must pause and remember today. Because conference, it was 80 years ago this very week that the international brigades were disbanded after their brave struggle against fascism in Spain and their heroic final stand at the Ebro. And we pay tribute today to those brave men and women, including one of this city's greatest sons, the legendary Jack Jones. They were prepared to sacrifice their youth, their futures, and their lives to try and stop the rise of fascism in Europe. And we need the same spirit today, conference, because make no mistake, those dangerous forces are on the rise again in our world, on a pace and a scale not seen since the days of the international brigades. And you know, it's not just the scenes from Charlottesville to Stockholm of masked thugs marching under neo-Nazi banners. It is also, far more dangerously, the rise of leaders projecting a form of nationalism not defined by love of one's country and love of one's people, but by hatred towards everyone else, by the erosion of democracy and free speech. And by the demonization of any minority, any religion, and indeed any media outlets deemed to be the enemy. And everywhere we see those governments today, we know they are contributing to the creation of a world which is the very opposite of the international. A world where the human race is more divided, more drowning in hatred than at any time since the 1930s, and a world which is utterly, therefore, unable to deal with the problems that we collectively face. That is why our world leaders shrug their shoulders as climate change crisis reaches the point of no return. That is why governments like ours continue to sell arms to Saudi Arabia, even when it is proven that those weapons are being used to get to murder innocent children in Yemen. That is why in the, in the war in Syria too, you know, it remains so intractable and destructive with dozens of major countries involved not striving to stop it, but playing their own lethal power games with other people's lives. And that is why North Korea can happily continue developing their bomb, Iran can help Nazanin jail for a third year, Myanmar and Cameroon can slaughter their own citizens at will, Russia can act with impunity, not just in Syria, but in Salisbury, and Donald Trump, can tear up treaties it took other leaders years to agree. All because, conference, the world order has been turned into a global free-for-all, and the leadership to fix it is simply not there. But conference, it's here. It's here in this hall, it's here on this stage, and it's here in Jeremy Corbyn. And we, as the Labour Party in government, must be there to lead the world in a different direction. So with Mia Griffith's leadership, we will support our forces, maintain 2% defence spending, invest more in peacekeeping, respect our international treaties, and never hesitate to defend ourselves, our allies, and our citizens abroad. But equally, we will never, as a party, go back to supporting illegal, aggressive wars of intervention with no plans for the aftermath and no thought for the consequences, whether in terms of innocent lives lost or the ungoverned spaces created within which terrorist groups can thrive.
And with Kate Ossimore's leadership, we will rise to the challenge that Nelson Mandela set this conference 18 years ago, when he told us one of Labour's major political and moral tasks in the 21st century was to become once more the keepers of our brothers and sisters all around the world. And with Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, we must and we will lead the world in promoting human rights, in reforming the arms trade, in pursuing an end to conflict, in supporting not demonizing refugees, and in turning the promise of a nuclear-free world into an, from an impossible dream into a concrete goal. And with the leadership of every single one of us conference, we must also honor the memory of the international brigades and lead the fight against the forces of fascism, of racism, of prejudice, and anti-Semitism. Because that is what we have always done. That is what we have always done, both at home and abroad, and that is what we must always do. We must always do that. We were there, we were there in Spain fighting Franco in 1936. We were there in Cable Street that same year, fighting alongside the Jewish community to stop the black shirts. We were here in Liverpool a year later when Oswald Mosley tried to speak in this great city and was forced out without saying a word. And we were there. And we were there in the 1980s. I was there myself when we marched against the National Front and let's remember, conference, we won all those battles. We beat the Black Shirts and the NF and the BMP and the EDL and whatever they call themselves today, however they dress up their racial hatred. And we are there in the same streets telling the fascism, no pasaran, no pasaran. And when we look back on all those battles, stretching back 80 years, I make a simple point. It wasn't the Tories assembling in the streets to fight the forces of fascism. It has been the men and women in this room. It's been Jack Jones and Jeremy's parents. It's John Landsman and Len McCluskey, Diane Abbott and Dawn Butler, Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald. And so while I make the... And so while I make the point of never disagreeing with anything that John says, I disagree with him on this. We don't need a new anti-Nazi league because the anti-Nazi league is in this hall and on this stage. The conference, conference, let me speak to you about something from the depths of my heart and my soul, and I say something I never thought that I'd have to say in my lifetime as a Labour member and an activist, and it's simply this. If we want to root out fascism and racism and hatred from our world and from our country, then we must start, we must start with rooting it out in our own party. And we all support the Palestinian cause, and we are all committed to recognize the Palestinian state when we get into government. And I, and I stand here with no hesitation when I condemn the Netanyahu government for its racist policies and its criminal actions against the Palestinian people. But I know as well, and we must all acknowledge, that there are sickening individuals on the fringes of our movement who, who use our legitimate support for Palestine as a cloak and a cover for their despicable hatred of Jewish people and their desire to see Israel destroyed. Those people stand for everything that we have always stood against and they must be kicked out of our party in the same way that we kicked out Oswald Mosley from Liverpool.
And conference, there is something more. Because if we truly want to realize the dream of the Internationale, to unite the human race and reunite our country, then again, we must start with uniting our own party and ending the pointless conflicts which divide our movement, which poison our online debate and distract us from our job, which is fighting the Tories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. We're about to move on to the main debate. I have two things that I want to say before we start it. I want to send solidarity to our teaching assistant delegate from Abercrombie who spoke yesterday, who's had a difficult time online due to some right-wing tabloids deciding to hound him. You inspired us yesterday with your passion for education and for our children, and your party stands with you. Please don't lose faith. I also want to say, before we move on to the floor debate on an issue that we all care passionately about, we are about to de debate a motion, or several motions, which are so emotive for so many of us. And I'd like to remind us to be aware of the importance of our language and our conduct when we're discussing the issue of Israel and Palestine. Our party, our party is totally and completely committed to protecting the freedom of our members to discuss and debate and condemn the actions of the Israeli government and the situation of the Palestinians. We are also committed to our conference being a safe, welcoming space for all religious and ethnic minority groups. We want this to be an outward looking and productive debate focused on the ongoing plight of the Palestinians and the situation in the Middle East, and not an inward looking debate which focuses on internal party matters and NEC decisions. Please think carefully about the language you use and how you express yourself. And please ensure that every speaker is made to feel welcome and nobody is booed or heckled for having a view which you may disagree with. I just want to remind everyone that our intention is to give as many people as possible an opportunity to speak. And if I cut you off or quiet you from the floor, it is only with the intention of giving the floor back to the membership. So many thanks. We'll now take speakers. Can I see all those who wish to speak in this debate? Can I also ask that if you've already spoken, that you allow other people the chance and move away from trying to get chosen again? I appreciate everyone has got. Okay, I'm going to take the delegate with the red dress on over here. Yep, that's you. I'm going to take the delegate right at the front here with the blue. A reference back. Can I have the two speakers I've already called come down for the front and the reference back? Can you come forward? Wherever you've. And just whilst we're waiting for everyone to get. Take the reference back first. Yeah, we're taking the reference back. We're just waiting for the speaker to come from the floor. Which in the reference back?
Thank you, Chair. Conference, Liam Crowther, delegate from Hastings and Rye. I'm first-time delegate and a first-time speaker. <laughs> Comrades, I move to reference back the sections about electoral reform on pages 104 and 117. On page 102, the Commission says that electoral reform was once again the most frequent submission topic, but the document does not acknowledge or respond to calls by dozens of CLPs for an immediate consultation of the membership on proportional representation. Instead saying electoral reform should be looked at in the Constitutional Convention once Labour is in government. Simply put, this is kicking electoral reform into the long grass. We've already preempted the Constitutional Convention by promising Lords reform and votes at 16. So why should we not listen to these CLPs and consult the membership about whether to also commit to voting reform? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Delegate, just before you go, can you remain at the lecture and you've moved a reference back. Can you specify precisely which section of the report you wish to be referred back to for further uh, consideration? Sections about electoral reform on pages 104 and 117. There's nothing about electoral reform in those pages. Um, on 102, there's a reference to electoral reform being the most frequent submission topic. It doesn't feel that the, there's a large number of CLPs which pass motions for proportional representation, which were then omitted. Okay, can I ask that you go away and come back with precise sentences and we'll take some details from you so we can get the exact point that you're referring to. Okay, I just want to choose, whilst the first speaker prepares, I just want to choose one more speaker. Um, I'm going to take, there's a delegate in a black jumper over in the front of the first box. Yes, you're standing up. Yep, that's you. Don't worry, there's plenty of time for speakers. I'd ask that people don't keep their hands up because not everyone has the ability to do that. Um, so if everyone can... Come down and we'll call the next speakers in a bit. Delegate, you've got three minutes. Angela Carr, Fair and CLP, speaking on behalf of the Brexit and economy motion. Brexiteers are very keen to tell us that on the 23rd of June 2016, the people decided to leave the EU and that it would be a negation of democracy to have another referendum. Rest assured that all of the leading Brexiteers would now be arguing for another referendum had it gone the other way, <laughs> the vote. Rest assured about that. Um, Nigel Farage implied um, that there would be another referendum uh, in his unfinished business quote. Their anti-democratic argument is specious and phony. David Davis said, if a democracy cannot change its mind, it ceases to be a democracy. <laughs> democracy requires that people know and understand what they are voting for. No one could possibly have known about or understood half of the ramifications of exiting the EU when they voted on 23 June 2016. The effects of leaving the EU on the economy, trade, investment, jobs, educational exchange, scientific and cultural collaboration, agriculture, the Irish border, and much, much more are complex and arcane. It's said that those who seek a re second referendum are suggesting that the electorate are stupid and uneducated. Not true. This argument is tendentious. No one can argue that Brexit is not infinitely more complex than we were ever led to believe. The public debate during the referendum focused almost entirely on two issues, immigration and the cost of membership of the EU. Other issues may have been discussed, but did not impinge greatly on the national consciousness in the same way as these two issues. We now have a much better understanding of the implications of Brexit. So we should have an opportunity to consider the deal agreed between the government and the EU, or no deal, if that is the result, and in the light of whatever emerges, have a people's vote 
to decide if we want to accept that outcome or if we want to remain members of the EU. In conclusion, it is Barham CLP's belief that the Labour Party should adopt the policy of having a second referendum or people's okay. vote. Thank you, conference. Chair, Conference, Taranjit Chana, GMB Union, speaking on Composite 8. First time delegate, first time speaker. <laughs> Conference, a hostile environment has always existed for BAME people. But under a Tory government, things have only got ever worse. Back in the 1970s, South Asian women were subjected to degrading immigration rules strip search and forced to go through most intimate of intimidation. This at the same time as those brave warrior women at the Grumwick strikes fought for their rights, not, not just for themselves, not just for migrant women, but for all workers. Here in Liverpool, after the war, hundreds of Chinese sailors who had fought the Nazis in Europe were told they were an undesirable, elements in Liverpool. They were sent back to China, ripping families apart, leaving wives without husbands and children here in Liverpool without fathers. And remember the signs, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Conference, we thought that this was a thing of the past. But this Tory government has brought the things of our shameful past back into our future. And also, sadly, for my present. Just six hours after the Brexit vote, while I was at work in a specialist women's service, a women's service user who accessed our services had her hijab ripped, ripped off her. She was punched and beaten. And just a few months ago, I myself was racially and homophobically abused in Whitehall with words I don't want to repeat in this hall by a man with so much venom and hatred, it left me shaking to my core. Conference, this is the hostile environment that this disgraceful Tory government has not just created, but actively encouraged to grow. It has cost the lives from the victims of racist attacks on our streets and public transport, and to Dexter Bristol, who is part of the Windrush generation, who died waiting for a passport that he was rightfully entitled to never came because of long home office delays. Trees and Mays go home vans to the 50% of workers witnessing racism at the workplace. BAME communities up and down the country feel less safe than ever before. Conference, this is why we need a Labour government to scrap the Immigration Acts. This is why we need our trade unions to stand up to racism in the workplace. And conference, this is why we need Jeremy Corbyn and not Theresa May as our Prime Minister. Please support. <laughs> Solidarity. Conference, I'll just take three more speakers whilst the next speaker prepares. Can I see all hands? Um, can I see take the delegate the furthest back in the centre middle block. Uh, yes, you that you've, that's just stood up. Perfect. Um, can I take um, the delegate showing in the blue jumper at the front here? I know we've got a reference back, so if you would like to make yourself come forward. Oh, right at the back, or was that a reference back? Right at the back, okay, that's fine. I know to go right, right to the back. <laughs> Please, no reference facts. Um, and we have a, the delegate that the uh, steward is representing. Yep, you. I didn't call you there.
Uh, Sarah Jane Potter, TSSA, um, newly elected councillor in Stevenage. Uh, conference, uh, conference, I am supporting Composite 9 regarding Palestine. In 1942, C.S. Lewis wrote, The greatest evil is now not done in those sordid dens of crime that Dickens loved to paint, but in, it is conceived and ordered in clean, carpeted, warmed and well-lit offices by quiet men with white collars and cut fingernails and smooth-shaven cheeks who do not need to raise their voices. Hence, my symbol for hell is something like the office of a thoroughly nasty business concern. It is now 2019, and Donald Trump and his administration are an example of just that. We all know that Trump's decision to move the US Embassy to Jerusalem was a provocative one, to say the least. Time to coincide with the 70th, with the 70th anniversary of the expulsion of 700,000 people during the creation of Israel when he knew that people would be protesting with the Great March of Return. As we already heard from two of the delegates earlier about the medics shot, including Razan al Najjar, a 21-year-old Palestinian medic, shot and killed by Israeli snipers as she was treating an injured protester, and I'm sure many people here will remember the pictures of her mother in the media clinging on to the vest that she was wearing, showing the bullet hole entrance and exit. That vest was her only weapon. According to the Geneva Convention, knowingly firing at a medic wearing clear insignia is a war crime. We can easily criticize the US government. We can easily criticize the US government for their hands in the atrocities that have taken place in Palestine, but we should firstly look at our own government, which is now selling record numbers of arms to Israel. I support a freeze of UK government arms sales to Israel, an international investigation into Israel's use of force against the Palestinians, and an, end to, an immediate end to the blockade on Gaza. I will continue to speak out against the apartheid practiced against the Palestinians, and I hope that in supporting this motion conference that you will too. Thank you. Chair, Conference, Lemford Vassal, Unite the Union. I am going to support and speak on behalf of the Composite Eight. And actually, I am a Windrush baby. In, in 1967, when I came here to join my parents, my parents, my father was a steel worker, my mother was a nurse. They were invited here to help out this country. They were British citizens when they arrived. When I arrived, I was a British citizen. However, in 19... 86, 87, I was asked to pay for citizenship. And at the time, I was convinced this was not necessary. It has now come to pass, I was correct. <laughs> Conference, the Windrush scandal and the hostile environment policy which led to it raises one fundamental question, and that is, what does it mean to be a British citizen? Ask yourself that question. I've tried to ask myself that question. I finished my primary school education here, my secondary school education here, I studied at university here, and I've worked all my work in life, 40 odd years in this country, but yet, as such, if I was to leave this country, I could be challenged as to whether I have the right to return back to the UK. 
What does it mean that working people who have lived here for decades, who has never been to the so-called countries that they've been deported to, and I use the word deported in its widest context, people who have children, grandchildren, homes, jobs, who have lost contact with their families, who have lost their jobs, their relationships have come to an end because they, in my view, and I'm sure you'll all agree with me, they were wrongfully detained and shipped back to the Caribbean or Africa or India or wherever they were shipped back to. What does it mean if they can be hauled from their homes and imprisoned? Sorry, Delegate, if you could wind up. Yeah. Conference, make no mistake, the Windrush scandal was no accident. It was the result of some oversight. It wasn't the result of some oversight or administrative error. This was planned, this was calculated, and this was intended. As conference, the result was not just some inconvenience. Three UK citizens, and they were UK citizens, believe me, same as I am, by any sane definition, died before they could be repatriated from the Caribbean back to the UK. Now just think about that. They died waiting to come back to the country where they were, okay, some okay. of them were born. Sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. They died in a country that was not their own. The fact that Whitehall bureaucrats in the Home Office thought it was their home simply because of their skin colour. Well, conference, there is a word for that. Delegate, please, thank you. Conference. What value is a promise from this government? Let us reflect the finest traditions of our movement. Let's close ranks, UK citizens, European citizens, citizens of the world, and have chosen, who have chosen you, to call their, this country their home. Let us stand together, and collective yeah, strength you, is more powerful than hollow promises. The People Conference, I support this motion. Thank you so much, everybody, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much to everyone supporting at the back, people at the back. You're on the periphery, but if you want to speak, your viewpoints are, viewpoints are just as wanted to be heard as everyone else is here. Thank you so much to everyone expressing solidarity to the people in Palestine, as well as the people affected by Windrush and Grenfell. Uh, it's excellent. Thank you so much. It's also great to be speaking alongside a panel with a majority of women uh, it's just great to see from the back. I want to speak about Brexit in support of the motion because I think the motion is comprehensive and covers all of the bases, all of the boxes that people, of Bre uh, the people who want to know about Brexit um, and need. Uh, fundamentally, um, fundamentally, the point I want to make is that we, we need to speak with absolute clarity and clearness on this topic of Brexit and that comes from our leadership, but also us at the grassroots, in the CLPs, up and down our country. If Kia and John McDonald are reading from the same hymn sheet, hymn sheet representing all of us in this broad church of labour, then the people in mainstream media won't have the clout and the justification to write anti-socialist articles about us because Brexit will be uh, clearly the viewpoint that's going to result in people voting for a Labour government. Secondly, with that, it's important for us at the grassroots, at the CLP level, to be, to be the ones who have also got the confidence to speak about Brexit. I myself, James Cantwell from North East Bedfordshire, Biggleswade is my town. Uh, I speak here not just as a trained journalist and marketer, 
but as our youth delegate and the person who ran in the home ward as a town councillor in Biggleswade, where we narrowly lost in the recent snap election. When I was on the streets with my friends campaigning to get that Labour vote for that town council, I was there not just speaking about housing and about education, but bottom line, they were, we were speaking about Brexit as well, because that's what people care and genuinely want confidence in their Labour government for. Resultantly, when people spoke to me about Brexit, I was able to, to speak confidently with regards to where we stand. And I think this comprehensive motion covers all of the basis for that. If we speak about Brexit, and we speak about Brexit with confidence, then when we speak about education, and we speak about how Stratton Upper School has not had the opportunity to teach not only my younger brother, but younger sister in the same way that they taught me 10 years ago. And if we speak about housing in the same way that we speak about Brexit, council houses, not just genuinely affordable houses, then I think fundamentally we will have a next Labour government with the full support of everyone in the Broad Church of Labour behind Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you very much. I fully appreciate the time. Beautifully on time. Well done, delegate. I'm going to take three more speakers whilst the next speaker prepares. Um, can I get a delegate at the front row who's just moved a little bit with the glasses? Yes, yes, you. Um, um, can I get a delegate, I think, who's wearing, is that a hat? Yes, yes, yourself. I'm trying to get a spread of the room. I know, I know, it's very frustrating. Um, we've got, is it a delegate in a black top with, a, with blonde hair? Yes, yes, you're, you've just moved, yep. Theresa Bettis, Meriden CLP, newly elected member of the National Policy Forum. I came here first time in 2015 as a re rejoined member. And I said then, and I reiterate today, that as a socialist, I feel I've come home. I've waited 50 years for a socialist leader of the Labour Party. All my adult life, I've dreamt of a socialist government that would transform our country, a country where everyone counts, where we would look after everyone from cradle to grave, a country where no one sleeps on the streets or worries about how to feed their family. A country where hope, not hate or despair, is the order of the day. We know our people are struggling, thanks to the Tory austerity policies. This has to change. We know that they are out there, they depend on us. Without us, there will be no change. We have our friends in the media with their billionaire tax-avoiding owners of course, they share the same interests and values as we do. <clears throat> they have, for the last two years, watched their friends in the Tory party fight each other over Brexit. We have a Tory leader who's about as capable as negotiating a deal as she is of dancing. <laughs> what a shambles. What a disgrace. I know that our GE day is on the way. Our enemies are out there. They're running scared. Why do we know they're running scared? Because I'll tell you why. Because day after day, in the newspapers, on social media, 
we have relentless attacks upon us. Sneers, accusations, smears, and shamefully, from a tiny number from our own ranks. All of this is designed to divide us, to weaken us. Let's make no bones about it, the forces against us are enormous. But I tell you, we have an army, over half a million strong. We are more determined than ever to fight for our people. We have a leader, a leader like no other, who's given us a belief that if anything is possible, as long as we keep our nerve and stay united, we, we have to put our trust in Jeremy, in John and in Keir and the rest of the team to see us through. This is the team that created the inspirational 2007 general election Delegate, manifesto. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Hi, I'm from Wickham CLP, first time delegate, first time speaker. And I'll be speaking about the Palestine motion. Conference, this motion shows the injustices the Palestinian people suffer, injustices begun by the British Empire. a colonial British army that suppressed an entire people. This, leg this legacy of British colonialism, which destroyed communities around the world, is far-reaching. We just heard about the injustices British citizens of the Windrush generation face. So this legacy opened, opens wounds that we, as a party committed to internationalism and fairness, must heal. But conference, colonialism is more than a legacy. It is a daily experience for many BAME refugee and migrant communities here. For us, colonialism is a force that marginalizes, discriminates, and worst of all, a force that silences. From the horror of Grenfell to Windrush, colonialism and the racism it is based on is alive, if invisible to many. Over 100 BAME, refugee and migrant community organizations, raised these important issues in a collective statement, promising to fight this erasure and the silencing of the Palestinian people. We explain how this summer shows the urgent need for education about British history. We have much to learn as a party, not least about the Nakba and why Palestinians were made refugees and the role British colonialism played in parts of the world that still suffer from its effects. Our communities must be listened to. We cannot repeat the Iraq war, where BAME and migrant communities left the Labour Party in droves, resolving never again to vote for Labour. We cannot marginalise and ignore concerns when they speak out about the racism they face, or when they demand justice for themselves and for Palestine. Conference, we cannot be a party complicit with the worst of history. This motion gives us a chance to stand with the brave Palestinian people, their just cause and their rights. We can all learn from their dignity and courage. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Brigitte Anton and I'm from Northern Ireland CLP. I have been here eight times. Uh, this is my first speech and there haven't been many Northern Ireland members on this platform. Um, and I want to dedicate this to one of our oldest members in the CLP, Eric, this is for you. What I also want to say is that I'm old, an, an EU citizen and I've been in Northern Ireland 30 years. 
My, my talk is on Brexit, and I fear that we will be the next Windrush generation. When I was nearly 10 years in Northern Ireland, I voted in the Good Friday Agreement. We got the text of the agreement, we knew exactly what we voted on. This was not the case in the referendum. On top of this, I could not vote in the Brexit referendum. Northern Ireland voted 56% to remain, but our voices have not been heard enough in this debate. I campaigned for remain, and even we did not realize the implication of a Brexit vote on Northern Ireland. We often have been talked about, in particular, in relation to the Irish border, but we haven't been often enough handed over the microphone. On top of this, Labour still does not allow Labour members to stand candidates in Northern Ireland. The people in Northern Ireland can also not vote Labour. This is a huge democratic deficit. We need to address this. <laughs> people in Northern Ireland can vote Tories and UKIP, but they can't vote Labour. At the moment, we are facing increased stagnation about our political situation. We have no government that hasn't been functioning for over 600 days. We have Brexit that threatens our peace and stability that we had for 20 years. Also, Brexit threatens our human rights because at the moment, people who want an, a British passport, who have born in Northern Ireland, and want to have a British passport or, or, or and an Irish passport, might possibly not have the same rights. This is a huge, it will be a huge difficulty. And then on top of it, at the moment, universal credit is rolled out in Northern Ireland in places where there's high deprivation, more than in the rest of the UK, where there's high suicide rates, high levels of disability, and high levels of mental health. This is a toxic mix, and we need to address it. Thank you very much. What I want to finish this off is that I don't think the demand for a people's vote and the demand for Labour government are in contradiction. I want both. Thank you, I want delegate. a people's vote, and I want a Labour government. And what I just want to conclude is, You're the done, members in Northern delegate. Ireland, we, if you debate, no debate without us when you talk about us. Thank you very much. We deserve better. I'll take some more speakers, three more speakers before. Um, I'd ask you not to take advantage of my kind nature and please stick to time. We're not doing a very good job of that. Um, and also I had a very helpful note actually from someone to say, please can all speakers make sure you say what motions you're speaking on. We're having an incredibly broad debate here and it's not always clear. So please not only state your name, who you're representing, but also what you're actually going to be talking about. Um, okay, can I get a speaker? And is it the yellow top right at the front in that back block there? Yes, you, yep, with the bright, yep, bright yellow top. Bright yellow top, yep, that's fine. Then I'm going to work my way across the room um, as far as I can see. I know everybody, I can see everybody, or I'm, I'm actually nobody at the same time, so it's a bit of a challenge. Um, can I see, is that a person in a red scarf, is it, at the back? Yep, the person who's just stood up in the red scarf, perfect. And then in this block, um, the... Yes, yes, you, exactly. Perfect. We've got plenty of time, don't worry. Next speaker, thank you very much. Elsie Greenwood, Delegate and Youth Officer from Newark CLP. And yeah, I'm also here to talk about Brexit, so sorry about that, but thank goodness we are. Um, I want to start by saying I understand the comrade from Blythe's concerns earlier and we are right to be concerned about the neglect your constituency has faced. 
but let's not forget who here is to blame, and that is the Tory government that ripped apart your mining town like my one Mansfield next door to me. Now, it must be said, Conference, from the start of Brexit talks, I've seen a failure to talk about Brexit's disproportionate impact on people who already face discrimination and prejudice, women, people from BAME communities, disabled people, and the LGBT community. As a 16-year-old, I wasn't given any opportunity to have a say during the Brexit campaign. Yet, as a bisexual woman, this disproportionately affects me, just like it will others who are marginalised in society. Conference, women are more likely to be low-paid, single parents, carers, or to work in our vital public services. A damaged economy with fewer jobs means even less money in people's pockets and lower tax receipts to pay for our beloved public services. As we know, austerity hit women harder and Brexit will do the same, if not worse. Similarly, through the EU, the LGBT community has been protected, protected and institutionally supported by a 28-strong network of states championing LGBT rights across the globe. After decades of oppression, this isn't something my community is willing to give up. Conference, this is an opportunity to unite Labour behind a clear plan fighting for liberation, fighting to protect women, members of the Delegate LGBT the community and the disabled and BAME members across the country. We must agree to a principle of a public vote, a people's vote. Do you really think the Tories will protect minority groups, Thank support you. women, support LGBT people, vote for the Brexit motion? Thank you. Nadine Granderson Mills, BAME Labour Delegate, supporting Motion 8. Conference, the hostile environment policy is cold, callous and calculating. And from the treatment of the Windrush generation and their children, the Tory government would have you believing they have amazing abilities, superpowers so special a film studio could create a blockbuster movie out of them. The first, alchemy and the manifestation of miracles, transforming the impossible into the possible. The ability to magic mountains of evidence proving their right of indefinite leave to remain after deliberately destroying their landing cards. The second selected site, the natural cloak of invisibility for promotions, proper pay and real representation in economic and political power but a visibility so strong for immigration targets, they draw the attentions of the Home Office like a lodestone. And the third, and my personal favorite, morphing. An ability mightier than the mighty morphing Power Rangers, the power to turn from citizens of value into villains here illegally. Conference, we say shame. Shame on you, Theresa May. The Windrush generation aren't alchemists. They aren't only visible when it suits, and they certainly aren't just numbers to top your fantasy targets. The Windrush generation are people, a people not illegal, but invited to help rebuild a post-war Britain. Their blood, their sweat, their tears infused into the dynamic and vibrant society that we enjoy and experience today. Family, friends feeling unwanted and welcome in a place they call home. Conference, the hostile environment policy is heinous. It hampers the trust in the Home Office. BAME Labour will not tolerate the Windrush generation and their children being used, abused and discarded. BAME Labour does not call, do not just call on the government for contrition, but for compensation and justice, for the wretchedness wrought, for the families wrecked, for destinies destroyed, for those denied services and destitute, for those dealing with delays, for those locked and languishing in detention centres, for those refused re-entry, and for deportees who have died. Theresa May, abandon your hostile environment policy, protect their British status and restore their rights, deal with cases quickly, reinstate immigration appeals, shut down Yards Wood and Brook House. Conference, stand in solidarity with the Windrush generation. Please support, thank you. Get speaking to time are celebrated. Gratefully, greatly appreciated.
Um, Hilary Wise, Ealing and Acton Central. Uh, my first conference, first speech, but great to be here for, I think it's a historic occasion to have the first proper debate on Palestine. So I'm speaking for motion nine. And Madam Chair, um, I have to say I did take into account your opening remarks, but there is a bit of an elephant in the room here, and I always believe in addressing elephants with great respect, obviously, so I shall do that. Um, because I've been campaigning uh, for Palestinian rights for about 30 years now, and I've never actually seen anything quite like the, it is a campaign of uh, slurs and accusations of anti-Semitism. Um, against, largely against the leadership, against Jeremy Corbyn, against the left of the party. I, <clears throat> I have looked into these allegations very carefully. I'm an academic, I know how to do research. A few of them are justified. Most of them actually are not. I'm afraid it is an orchestrated campaign. Um, if you want to know a little bit about how the orchestration works, you can watch that Al Jazeera program, the documentary which was made two years ago. It's called The Lobby. You can watch it Delegates, online. Please do that. You to be very careful with You'll your just right get because you're straying into territory. Sorry. I would ask you to be very careful with your language. I'm being very careful. I do assure you, I'm being that. extremely careful. Yeah. Um, so, so just watch that that program. Um, so you can see what we're up against. Uh, while I'm here, just a quick word to the media, because media, lots of famous faces all around. Um, the message really is shame on you for picking up and amplifying these allegations. Because they do not, they do not challenge, they do not analyze, they do not go and look. What's, what has happened to investigative journalism? It's really... It's, it's a bit of a mix of, you know, politicking and, and just shoddy journalism, in my view. Um, well, I'm afraid to tell you this is going to get rather worse um, as the prospect of a Jeremy Corbyn-led government gets ever closer. I'm afraid the campaign will get ratcheted up. And also, the list of people being proposed to the party, people being denounced um, for being anti-Semitic, um, often, often, obviously, just being proponents of Palestinian rights, that list will get so longer and longer. It will stretch all right the way from here to, to Jerusalem. Uh, I'd ask you to take your seat, please. Anyway, uh, the, I'm sure facing the NCC would not be a, a pleasant experience, but I believe in taking the long view. Um, and some of us here remember the South Africa campaign. Delegate campaigns. your time's over. Please take your seat. Thank you yes, very much. Okay. So anyway, it will be a badge, no, it'll be delegate, a badge that's your time. of honour to have been involved in this campaign. Delegate, that's your time. Thank you. Oh. Right, can I take three more speakers from the floor? Um, can I get delegates from this block? Can I get a delegate at the front here? Yes. Oh, sorry, the, the, in the blue blazer, in the blue blazer behind, sorry. Thank you. I'll try and be clear because I am not being. Um, can I get, sorry, there's a lot of, I'm gonna, gonna stand up because I can't see, sorry. Can I get the delegate in the gray jumper and the blue sweater? Yep. And can I have, oh, can I take a point of order? If you want to come forward, and then we'll hear from the next spe speaker in just a second. Where's the point of order? Just let me hear the point of order before you. Are you coming down? I don't know where the Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mick Carney, TSSA. Uh, Chair. You got my full sympathy trying to chair a, a room this size. My president myself, we get about 100 delegates. It's, this is a bit bigger. Um, in that far corner down there, when you're calling for people to speak, people stand up at that point. Anybody that's in that corner that's vertically challenged, like I am myself, 
is not getting the chance to speak. Could you ask, ask you to bear this in mind, please? Thank you. I'll take that on board. Oh. <laughs> yeah, can I take the point of order? I'm sorry, delegate. If you just stand on the side, just stay there, that's fine. I will take the point of order. I need the point of order to come make it at the, the podium. Um, conference and chair. Chair, I'm really sorry, you asked me to come up just now. The woman with the red scarf, everybody around my, okay. my seating area heard me. And in fact, I've heard from lots of other delegates just now that the same thing has happened to them. Right, okay. That's fine, thank you. I will take that and we'll, we'll get it sorted. It's just difficult to see, so I'm identifying you. You're coming down and I don't know what you look like, but uh, we'll do what we can to make sure that as many people are selected and given a platform. Hello, I'm speaking on the motion on Brexit, although I'd urge you to support all of the motions taking place this afternoon. My name is Maddie Kirkman and I'm representing Edinburgh Central CLP, first time delegate, hello Scotland, first time delegate involved in the fun and games of compositing the text for this motion. Conference, I found a home in the Labour Party because of the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn and his continued opposition to an austerity agenda that, puts, that makes me unsafe. I and millions like me need a radical Labour government under Jeremy Corbyn. And when we get that government, not if, but when, I do not want its hands tied by a recession or the neoliberal trade deals that are the inevitable consequence of a Tory Brexit. Conference. No one can claim that the referendum result has not been respected. Article 50 has been triggered. The government has gone into negotiations for a deal. But we know in the trade union movement that when you negotiate a deal, you take it back to the grassroots to decide. And you would never do that with a deal that is worse than the status quo. We already know that Theresa May's deal will be a disaster for our economy and our communities. Conference. Tory Brexit is a threat to the rights of disabled people. For years, the Conservative Party have wanted to bring in their own British Bill of Rights, and Brexit is their, is their big chance to do so. And I don't know about you, but I don't trust Theresa May or any Tory minister to safeguard the interests of disabled people like me. And conference, my generation is still lumbered with the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis which has blighted our futures and left us poorer and less secure than our parents. And it would be a double injustice for us to carry the burden of a second crisis that was not of our making. Because I know my history and so do you, and a recession has never been good for workers, women or disabled people. This motion lays, the, lays out the only pathway for Labour to achieve the best outcome for the communities we represent. That starts by voting down Theresa May's deal in Parliament and then calling for an immediate general election. And if the Tories are too scared of that, then the option of a public vote is still on the table. Conference, I urge you to vote for this motion, vote down Tory Brexit and vote for the only way out of this mess. Solidarity. Scottish delegates keeping well to time, thank you very much. Okay. Sorry, can you take the conference? We had a Brexit this morning and we know it's open up to this afternoon. But we have also had the Windrush motion and very few BAME came up and we have a few lineup. Can you give the floor to some BAME please? Thank you. Delegates, like I said, this is an incredibly broad 
debate and we have ruled the Brexit is in order and I appreciate that a lot of people have a lot to say. I need everyone to just sit down and stop wondering about the whole I'm trying to call as many people as possible from as diverse a group of people as possible. I just need everyone to sit down and be patient. We've still got time but wondering about the whole is not is, is making it more difficult for me to find you and to give you a platform okay. So thank you very much to our next speaker. Conference. Katrina Gilman, Unison, speaking in this debate in relation to justice and security at home, supporting Composite 7. Proud to work in our police service and proud to be the Labour candidate for Telford. In our police service and across our justice system, we have been let down by Theresa May's failing Tory government. Cutting the number of police officers, police staff and PTSOs. Since 2010, we've lost more than a fifth of our workforce. The staff who remain there are overstretched and overworked. Our members work in forensic, in technical support, as criminal justice clerks. They answer your 999 calls. They are also the PCSOs, the backbone of neighbourhood policing teams. But they tell us they no longer have the time to do the community policing they join the police for. They tell us they are too busy providing cover for police officers or picking up work from other agencies who no longer have the resources to do those. Increasing the pressure on our members and crushing morale. And with these cuts, we have seen a rise of crime. Conference, we can do better than this. We must do better than this. And Labour does do better than this in Wales. Whilst the Tories cut neighbourhood policing, the Labour government in Wales have invested in more police and police staff to keep our communities safe. And conference, Chris Grayland's failing probation service is in crisis. The latest privatisation catastrophe. He has wrenched the probation service in two, centralising a part of it inside the Ministry of Justice and selling off the rest to the private sector. Breaking the vital link between probation and our communities. Our members work in these private companies tell us that profit, not public safety, comes first. The existential threat to our vital probation service continues with the disastrous privatisation in hostels. Working with failing equipment, short of resources, time and people while their workloads increase. In this climate, victims are being forgotten, are being failed. Not by the probation staff who are working heroically to sustain services against all odds. No, they are being failed by Chris Grayling, by Theresa May, by this failing Tory government. Our hard-working members in the police and probation service deserve better. Our communities deserve better. Support our people, providing these essential public services that we need to keep our communities safe. Thank you. Okay. We've got a point of order. If you've got a point of order, if your point of order is been made, please don't make it again, but if it's not, sorry Dale, if you, if you just let the point of order come first, just, just next, it's fine. Who's making the point, is someone coming, oh sorry. Here we go. Um, I just wanted to make the point of order about people keep coming up repeatedly. The chair has already said it, and it was spoken about this morning. We've had at least two people this afternoon. It's really uncomradely, actually, because we have so many people here. Everybody wants an opportunity, so actually, please respect your comrades and let other people have a chance. Thank you. Thanks, Delegate. I haven't been in the hall the whole time. I won't be able to do this. I have to rely on you, to be honest, and, and allow your comrades to have a space. Similarly, going over time, it's uncomradely, and we can only ask that you give each other the opportunity to be heard. <coughs> Sorry, Delegate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair, conference, newly elected councillor, Elizabeth Baptiste, representing BAME Labour. <laughs> and I'm also a proud Windrush baby. Conference. For some people, the outcome of Brexit was jubilant. For others, it was absolutely horrendous. The result of Brexit has created a hostile immigration environment that has been a stark 
increase, there has been a stark increase in hate crimes and incidents across the UK from the far right as a result of Brexit. It has made racial and ethnic minorities more vulnerable to racial discrimination and intolerance. It has led to racial profiling that has created high levels of anxiety among migrants. It has become the norm for migrants to be totally disrespected. Conference, more should be done to condemn incidents of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and outright discrimination. Bain Labour urges the party to ensure that it has clear immigration policies, whatever the outcome of post-Brexit, that protects EU and non-EU migrants from the threat of racial and ethnic discrimination. Conference, please remember that migrants contribute to the UK's economic prosperity. The TUC and the unions fought hard to ensure that all of us have rights at work. We must fight to ensure post-Brexit that the public services, economic growth and living standards are maintained. If we do not fight this, it will have a negative impact on the UK. You only have to look at the Rinrush scandal to see the horrors that befall workers, especially BAME workers, if a hostile immigration policy goes unchecked. Conference, Bay members are already disadvantaged economically. Brexit will escalate this, which is why we urge the party to ensure that it fights to keep the hard workers' rights that come from the EU and make sure that the UK workers get the same rights as workers in the EU into the future. We must ensure that we get the right Brexit deal, one that protects workers' rights, and we must ensure that migrants are afforded the dignity and respect that they absolutely, truly deserve. Thank you. Just going to choose another three speakers whilst the next delegate gets ready. Um, can I get... Um, can I invite back the woman with the red scarf who was correct in saying that I had called her? Thank you very much. Um, that's fine. Can I get um, the person being represented by the steward in the middle here? Fantastic. Um, I'm trying to be systematic, but I'm not doing a fantastic job at it. Um, okay. Yep, great, thank you. Fantastic. Chair, conference, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Universal greeting of Islam, which may peace and blessing be upon you all. It's like winning a lottery here today. I've been trying to speak for the last two days. I've got a lot of pain on my both shoulder. And Chair, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. I want to speak about Palestine. A Palestine, a 21st century apartheid. I've I visited Palestine we, with Labour to Palestine, some of our friends, councillors, ex-member uh, of parliament, 2013. What I saw, I pro probably don't want to see it again. What I've witnessed, I don't want to see this again. I saw our children, your children, normally guarantees some of the things that they want, we all know whether it's a trainer, 90 pound, 100 pound, I'm not gonna mention the names. But those children that I've seen, they don't have a school to go to. They don't have proper uh, facilities. They don't have a good homes to live in. 
They, the, and the, the poverty that I've seen, and the refugees in their own country. I have seen the other ones, which is the checkpoints. My God, please, I do not expect my enemies to go through those checkpoints. That's what I've, what I've seen. If these were your children, would that be acceptable to you? No, not to us as well. Those children is like our children. I've got children as well. Hundreds of people getting killed regularly. Why? There's got to be a solution in there. Somebody can go in there and say, right, this is not acceptable. I'm grateful that Labour, I did the, the uh, speech by Emily Thornby. I got more respect for her than I had before. What she spoke. When I traveled to Palestine, just give you my, my uh, experience. It was about 32 of us. When I was going into Tel Aviv, I was stopped for one hour. One hour. Question, question, question. Why? because my name is Ali Ahmed. Just because my name and my color. When I was coming out of Palestine, I was stopped for four hours. Four hours. I nearly missed my flight. I said, I'm gonna miss my flight. They said, well, there's not, not a lot that they, they can do. Obviously, I've been, I mean, Trump, you know what is then? I'm not going to go into details. Chair, I'm really sorry. Well. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, Confess. Palestine will be free. Just before you speak, Delegate, I just want to ask the Hastings and Rye Delegate, who tried to reference back, if they've got more specifics to make their way to the front, and we'll take you soon that's the Hastings and Rye delegate that already spoke and was looking to reference back okay thank you hello conference and chair I'd just like to say shalom to all of the Palestinian supporters and Palestinians out there My name is Jessica Leshnikov. <clears throat> I'm from Maidstone and the Weald, CLP in Kent. I'm a member of Unite the Union, and I'd like to talk about Brexit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of the delegates who attended the Brexit com compositing meeting on Sunday night. The truth is that the time we took to get this motion down to one composite was not because the meeting was divided, but because true socialists really care about getting this historic moment right. We care about getting this moment right and representing the mandate of our communities. I have no doubt <laughs> that many of us would have stayed far later than midnight just on this principle alone. Yesterday, our brother David Lamy MP said that you cannot kill democracy with more democracy. And I totally agree with that. But I go further, I go further. As the ugly picture of cruel Tory Brexit becomes clearer to everybody, voters are realizing they were sold a story that does not match up to the emerging reality of the damage this Tory government is causing to the very fabric of our society. So I say this, I want to guarantee that our party will provide easily understood raw data and information from which people can make an informed choice that reflects the needs of our country now. Conference, I speak as a Jew, as a woman from an immigrant family in which democracy was denied to us for many years over many generations. 
Many of you come from similar families to mine. And yet, even though it is 2018, we are living in a world where many people are still denied the right to choose how their lives are governed. We must, for their sakes, take this opportunity with both hands and run like the wind with it. Conference, please support the motion to campaign for a public vote. Thank you. Chair, Conference, Judy Richards, Brighton Pavilion, CLP. My brother Terry was in a reggae band about 40 years ago. A group of young people, friends and relatives, um, just in the last few years of school, and then going on to work and college, getting together for the love of the music. They played a few gigs, and of course, all of the proud parents were there at every gig they could get to, cheering them on, enjoying the music, getting on with the community. So we were a bit surprised when three years ago, Michael Anglin, one of the guys in the band, passed away at about age 50, suddenly of a stroke, and his father wasn't at the funeral. We now know that he was a victim of the Windrush scandal. In 1998, when some of our parents were starting to emigrate back to their countries of origin, Mr. Anglin had tried to get back into Britain through Heathrow after his sister's funeral and was told that because he did not have enough documents to prove that he had the right to be here, he had 48 hours to pack up his belongings and leave the country permanently. That's 35 years in this country, 48 hours to get out. In order to come back, he has to pay for his own flight. And yet those affected by this scandal have had no interim emergency payments to cover the loss that they've suffered. Sarah O'Connor, for instance, who passed away recently, was on the verge of being evicted from her home and made bankrupt because she was a Windrush victim and had not received any kind of interim payment. At the moment, there is a compensation scheme being consulted on where there is talk about having a ceiling, a cap. There's also talk about a minimum payment. So if you don't reach that minimum payment, you get nothing. How many people do we know where you put in a claim and somebody sits there with a red pen and says, you're not having that, you're not having that, you're not having that, and lo and behold, you're below the minimum payment. They need to be compensated in full for the horror of what they have suffered. <laughs> and for the loss. They have been paying into pension schemes for 40, 50, 60 years, and if they are going to be deported or denied the right to come back to this country, give them their money back with the interest that it would have earned in a bank. And look wider than just the windows. Because it's not just people from the Caribbean or Africa or India, it's the whole of the immigration system that is wrong. And those, and those Labour MPs that voted in 2014 against this scandal should hang their heads in shame. We need a review of the immigration system so that, for instance, people who are born here, who are white, but have married people from abroad, but don't earn £18,000 a year, cannot bring their foreign partners in. That's wrong. We know how easy it is for black people to be criminalised through the Lamy report. That also needs to be looked at. In 2020, we will be going to the UN to report on how this government, hopefully a Labour government, has been dealing with the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And if this Labour government, thank God, hopefully, in place then, has not got it right, we will be there criticising you. Please support this motion. I'm just going to take another round of speakers whilst the next um, speaker prepares. I just also, we haven't had the Hastings and Rye delegate back, so this is your final call to come back and uh, perfect to come forward and, and give us the, the specifics around your motion. We'll take you after the next speaker. Um, 
Right, where are we at? Um, I'm going to take this delegate at the front. I've neglected the back up there. If everyone could stay seated, is there a delegate there with a, is it a checked shirt? Is that a, yes, you that's just stood up, perfect, thank you. My apologies for anyone being, and can I get the delegate here, right at the front? Thank you again, Chair, for giving me the opportunity to clarify. Liam Crowter, Hastings and Rice CLP. Second time speaking, first time delegate. <laughs> uh, on page 104 of the National Policy Forum report, there is a section which refers to specifically the Commission had a discussion on electoral reform noting that there are a number of different potential voting systems to consider and that the Constitutional Convention promised in the manifesto was the best forum for such deliberations. As I said before, votes for 16-year-olds and up, something like that is not being taken to the Constitutional Convention. We're putting it forward now. And also on page 117, which is where the confusion arisen because as another speaker excellently put, there was a discussion on uh, voter ID, which is also entirely relevant, and I totally agree with that. On page 117, there is an entire section on electoral and constitutional reform, and that entire section, I think, needs to be referenced back. Uh, proportional representation, I think, is an important issue, and I do think that it's important not only to democratise this party, but also to democratise the nation at large. Thank, Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to take the point of order first. Yep, can the point of order come forward? Who's making the point of order? All right, okay. Thank you, darling. Conference Chair, this is my third time I've been turned away. When I put my hands up, yes, and when I come in front, two people discuss and then say, mm mm, mm mm. So my apologies, Conference and Chair, but I would like an opportunity to give a talk. Three times I have okay, been turned away. Sorry, yeah. Is it fair? Everybody wants, there are so many people Is it fair, conference? I appreciate that you've come up, but it doesn't mean you are picked, and I'm sorry. Please take fair? your seat. Please take your seat. Oh, I, if, I hear you. Conference. Can we be fair? So we need an independent person to elect from the floor. Well, Please. I was independently elected two years ago, Thank so you. that's you. it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it's frustrating getting near the end of conference. People haven't had an opportunity to speak. We, I know that everyone who sits up here does so in good faith and we do the best that we can to give as wide a range. And it's very frustrating when you think you've been picked and you haven't. All we can do is our best. Thanks for your patience, Delegate. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, conference, John Campbell, Proud to speak on this composite motion, the Windrush composite motion, on behalf of Unison. <laughs> 70 years ago, the Empire Windrush arrived at Tilbury Docks. Instead of celebrating their contribution to this country, this government has been hounding the Windrush generation, deporting them, locking them up in detention centres, refusing them life-saving NHS treatment, the very public services they spent their lives building. 
Our member, Michael Braithwaite, found himself caught or caught up in this nightmare, despite living here for 50 years, despite having worked at, a, at his school for 15 years, despite having the legal right to live and work in this country. None of this mattered to this government. Conference, you can talk tough on immigration, but you, can turn, you cannot turn away from the human cost. When the citizenship rights of the Windrush generation are revoked, when refugees and asylum seekers are left destitute and homeless, and constantly reminded that they are not welcome here, it leads to an unleashing of forces of hate. Fascists and racists have been encouraged to commit greater acts of violence, openly embracing white supremacy. And let's not have any illusions. You cannot duck this fight as a trade unionist or a Labour Party member. Conference, you need to know that we are defending public services. We are the defenders of that service, not immigration border guards. We will defend the rights of our members and their families wherever they come from. We deliver public services for all, but increasingly we are aware that this is, we are not all equal. Conference, we must bring the might of the labor, move, labor movement to bear against the hostile environment we face. We must fight for the Windrush generation and that all the generations of migrant workers that come after them. This goes to the heart of our fight for social and economic justice. Conference, please support this composite. Delians, you've got two more speeches to go before I choose another round, so I'd save your energy. Uh, conference, Cecile Wright, Derby North, uh, the daughter of the Rinrush generation. I stand here before you, Conference, to speak in favour of the Windrush, Justice for the Windrush uh, Generation motion, Composite Motion 8. Let us put the Windrush scandal into its context. That context is where prominent Tories have for decades sought to remove, stigmatise or use racist name-calling ever since the Windrush generation arrived in this country in 1948. Indeed, it was the Tory Enoch Powell who wanted us repatriated to avoid the rivers of blood. It was the Tory Margaret Thatcher who thought the country was being swamped by immigrants. It was the Tory Boris Johnson with his racist jibes of, of watermelon smiles and piccaninnies. And it was the Tory Theresa May who devised a hostile government, a hostile government policy and removed as many black Caribbeans as possible to keep down the net migration figures. So, what is the common link here? What is the common link? Racist jibes and racist actions by Tories. The Tories are the party of racism. Let us all Let us all in the Labour Party unite their racism, for it is the Tories we need to oppose. We urgently need a Labour government, 
led by Jeremy Corbyn. to reverse the legislation that has inflicted on the Windrush generation a crime against humanity. Please support the motion. Chair conference. Claire Lees, Unite the Union and very pleased to be able to speak in support of the motion on the rights of the Palestinians. Thank you. Unite, along with Youssef, moved an emergency motion at the recent TUC Congress on this very topic. Cuts to UNRWA, but also dealing with the racist nature of the new Israeli nation-state law. I can tell you that the emergency motion was carried unanimously by Congress, and I hope this conference will do the same. <laughs> Trump's actions in attacking UNRWA is a flagrant attack on Palestinian rights and must be seen as part of his wider campaign against the Palestinians and their aspirations for self-determination. Trump's decision to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem simultaneously moves to deny Palestinians the right to have Jerusalem as a capital of the Palestinian state. And it endorses the um, massive expansion of settlements which are encircling the city and cutting off East Jerusalem from the rest of the West Bank. His decision to cut $300 million of US funds to UMRA threatens the well-being of 5.6 million Palestinian refugees, the education of 560,000 children and the jobs of 22,000 teachers. This is a direct attack against the refugees of 1948 and 1967, an attack on their right of return. Thank you. We know exactly what happened this summer when Palestinians in Gaza demonstrated about their right to return. They were met with overwhelming force. Israel soldiers filed live rounds indiscriminately on unarmed protesters. Israeli snipers taking out Palestinian health workers tending to the wounded. We must back calls for an independent investigation into the shootings on the border with Gaza. Britain has a responsibility for creating the plight of the Palestinians in the first place. So it has a duty today to give support, ensuring justice for all Palestinians. <laughs> Conference, please show your support for this motion today and for the Palestinian cause like you did earlier by waving your Palestinian flag. Thank you. Support the motion. Thanks. Just before the next delegate comes up, I'm going to choose another three speakers. Um, I ha we haven't chosen many speakers who are being supported by a steward, so I want to pick this, the person who's being supported by this, the steward. Yes, in the back corner. Perfect. And the one who person, delegates who's being supported by the steward right at the back here. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You waving at me from the back. Perfect. And the member just on front of the steward there in this block. No, sorry, sir, not yourself. I'm going to have to stand up. Hey, with the glasses. Yep, turning into cake. In this, in this, in this block here. No. Wrong person's just stood up. <laughs> We're getting there. If the point of order wants to make it, take it to the front. Oh, yeah, I can't just give it to us. 
Okay. It's that person I'm trying to indicate there, right there. You need to work with me. Yes, you. Yes, you. Just working through the confusion now. Um, whilst we sort that, the, the delegate who's lined up to speak wants to take the platform and I'll sort the mess I've created. The people who've been called with a delegate who was in the middle, this block here, who's being supported by the steward. I couldn't see the person that was being supported by the steward, so I'm just going to have to trust the you were in this block right at the very, very back. No, no, I'm not choosing another speaker. It was someone who was already chosen and the person who's being supported over there already. So if you're sitting in this block and being supported by a steward, you weren't who I chose. Sorry, please, thank you. Conference, I bring you fraternal greetings from the great industrial city of Derby, the proud maker of trains and aero engines for over a century. And we in Derby look forward to the long overdue nationalisation of our railways. Conference, I want to speak to you on uh, composite number nine, on Palestine. Thank you. There is a lot in this motion to support. The alliance of the uh, Israeli government with demagogues like Donald Trump and Viktor Orban, uh, Orban is a disgrace to anyone with a conscience. The removal of UNRWA funding in such a dramatic and ill-conceived manner, plunging thousands of Palestinians into abject poverty with little access to education, to medical assistance, and to the basic necessities of life is beyond horrific. And it panders to the right-wing nationalism that we now see making its way across our globe. It's a far bigger existential threat than anything the Labour Party can do to the Jewish community. <laughs> comrades, and I speak specifically to Jewish comrades, Netanyahu and his, and, and his coalition have shown that they have no interest in the Jewish diaspora other than to ferment fear and draw them into Israel. Do not fall for this right-wing tactic. <laughs> comrades, Comrades, I remember the great and much missed Robin Cook and his ethical foreign policy, which was so callously thrown away by Tony Blair and his eagerness to cozy up to the American right wing. We, as a Labour Party, must never allow that to happen again. Conference, I offer heartfelt solidarity to my Palestinian brothers and sisters, as I do to hundreds of thousands of the hundreds of thousands of Israeli and Palestinians who rallied against the racist nation st state bill. <laughs> Conference, I also offer solidarity to the hundreds and thousands of our brothers and sisters right now in Idlib who are cowering fear, ready from the assault from Putin and Assad. Because if we are going to call out one horrific situation, we have to call out all the horrific situations across the world. <laughs> Comrades, in my opinion, I'm going to support this motion, but where I think it uh, fails is that it shows no recognition to genuine internationalism. If we condemn one country, then we must condemn them all. One right-wing regime, we condemn them all. And comrades, by fo focusing on this horrific conflict, there are many in the Jewish community asking, why only Israel? And why has it taken so long to recognize these fears for the British Jewish community? Comrades, this Sorry, motion, comrades, this motion, I, which I support, and I support the, the, the resolutions, give a one-sided narrative which triggers emotional responses rather than wise ones. This isn't helped, I'm afraid, by some members 
uh, of our party and some members of our PLP who are actively supporting expelled and sus suspended anti-Semites right now on platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delegate. We're just having a little bit of confusion over the, the speakers that were called and were not called, so I apologise for that. Oh. Conference Chair, thank you for calling me finally after hours with my hand up. Conference, let me start Labour International CLP. And start, thank you, we appreciate your support yesterday. Um, first, let me start by asking Conference what sort of referendum the Tories would hold that excluded UK citizens living and working in Europe and also Europeans living and working in the UK. Well, of course, conference, it was the Brexit re re referendum. We were excluded from voting in that. We have an interest, I think, in the question of Brexit. Our members in Europe have had a very hard time over the past two years. The uncertainty over free movement, as many of our members work in Europe and change countries as their work changes. The uncertainty in various EU countries. Those of our retired members worried our pensions will be frozen as our Australian members already and many other countries in the world have a problem when their pensions were frozen at the stage when they went to live in those countries. Has no one in the Tory government made the link between the shortfall we have in our NHS of 30,000 plus nurses, and it may have something to do with their uncertainty about Brexit? The P P Pessoe minority government in Spain has promised free health care to all. But after Brexit, will any of us in Europe get free health care? It was called a reciprocal agreement because it works both ways. Do you trust the Tories? I personally don't, and nor do many of the members in Labour International. In my opinion, you should never interrupt your enemies when they're making total idiots of themselves. It's not the job of the Labour Party to bail out the Tories. It is our job to replace them with Jeremy and with John. I believe that another vote aimed at reversing the result of the referendum is not just anti-democratic, but it won't solve the problems that are made by this Tory government. The problems of unemployment, of poverty, of homelessness. I was shocked at Brighton last year when we saw women and young men and old men and old women and disabled people all sleeping in doorways, cuddling their dogs to keep warm. We, the Labour Party, are ahead in the polls. Despite the media deluge that everyone's talked about, okay. including the state-funded BBC. Delegate, that's your time. Thank you very much. We're the biggest party in Europe. Thank you Let's very much. continue to go for a general election and win it with Jeremy and John. Safe and secure. Thank you very much, Delegate. Europe will be Thank safe. You. Thank you, comrades. If it's point of order, if you come up to the rostrum.
Hello. Um, I appreciate it's very difficult because there are a lot of people here and we all want to speak. Um, but I was, the steward on my side was actually pointed to, and she did have her hand up. When I came over here, I was told that I couldn't speak because you hadn't selected me. So I just think it would be really wonderful if at the next conference we could have a better way of choosing speakers that was more democratic <laughs> and that maybe involves some kind of digital, you know? Thank you. Thanks. If you were the person who was represented by the steward in that corner, then you should have been, that's, that's what's caused the confusion. The, the person, the, the only two people that should be down here were the people who were represented by the steward in that corner over there and the steward in that at the back over there. Okay, right. I wholeheartedly support that point of order, wholeheartedly. Um, we've got, we're in a little bit confusing situation where we don't know who's being called at the moment, so if we just bring forward the next speaker. <clears throat> Comrades sisters, brothers. This is my first conference and my first speech as delegate. Thank you. Um, I was recently elected the Women's Officer for North East Hertfordshire, CLP, and I'd like to thank my fellow Eastern Region delegates for their contributions over the past few days. Uh, I'm speaking today in favour of a motion brought by Harlow and Wolverhampton South West CLPs, a motion which I commend for its poignancy and principles with regards to Palestine. Uh, following a particularly abominable spate of violence on the 14th of May, where um, an estimated between 58 and 62 innocent protesters were killed by the IDF, I'm proud to report that North East Hearts constituency passed a similar motion to what's been proposed, where we called our incumbent cons Conservative MP Oliver Heald and for the Parliamentary Labour Party to sign the early day motion 1163 titled Violence Against Protesters in Gaza. Uh, we called for support of an independent international investigation into Israel's use of force against Palestinian demonstrators. And this was particularly relevant because on that 14th of May, people were found with wounds that were um, in line with weapons that are against um, this national law. Um, and thirdly, we called for a freeze of UK government arms sales to Israel pending the results of such an investigation. Um, and much like today, we called for an immediate and unconditional end to the illegal blockade and closure of Gaza. To this day, uh, we've not had a reply from Oliver Heald. Um, and comrades, we will continue to see motions like this. We will continue to have these debates time and time again. We will continue to see these same problems and these same plight of the Palestinian people until we have a government that is willing to make meaningful and holistic change. And I believe that the Labour government will do that. I believe the Labour government is ready and waiting and is going out there very soon and is going to make that meaningful, holistic change in all areas that we have talked about tonight. The, uh, the pervasive, systematic and all too painfully long-standing status quo of state repression within Gaza and the West Bank must end. I applaud Jenny Thornby for her comments earlier this weekend. And I say to you now that we must speak out for our Palestinian sisters and brothers because they are dying. They are dying with no access to medical care. They are stopped at the borders when they have appointments in Israeli clinics. We must speak out for our Palestinian sisters and brothers because they are losing yet more land to um, settlements that contravene international law. And we must speak out for our Palestinian sisters and brothers when their vital resources, their hospitals, their schools, their roads, their water supplies um, are destroyed by state repression or choked by inadequate funding. So conference, I urge you to support this motion. We owe it to the people of Palestine. Uh, we'll wrap up. We owe it because we will not compromise on our principles of democratic socialism, pro-liberation and pro-freedom yeah, that people time. like Corbyn have been elected on and have been working for decades. So conference, please support the motion. Delegates, due to the long running of many, many speeches, we are going to have to take this as our last delegate speaking. I've, there's more time tomorrow to speak in a debate if you haven't had an opportunity, which is in tackling health and inequality. So I'm going to invite the last speaker to speak um, so that we don't end up here all night. I appreciate it.
Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ruth Hayes speaking on behalf of Unite. I'm, like many people, a first-time delegate to this conference. I'm a branch secretary of a branch which represents advice workers, those who work in independent advice agencies, law centres, citizens' advice. And I'd like to speak on the Justice and Home Affairs report and on legal aid. Conference, yesterday we heard speaker after speaker talk about the way in which austerity has devastated our communities. Food banks, cuts to youth services, rise in mental health issues, poverty wages and homelessness. However, we've also heard about how communities are taking practical action to support each other and to provide solidarity. In my own union, we have the Period Dignity Campaign. Disabled people's organisations are taking action against universal credit. Young people fighting for rights at work in restaurants and hotels. A sector where we were told people wouldn't join unions. They were wrong. They did. Legal aid has been cut to ribbons by the Tories. For example, in 2009, there were over 132,000 housing cases funded through legal aid. This has fallen by 70%, 70, 70, at a time when there's a massive housing crisis. There's now a growing skills shortage amongst lawyers and advice workers and a lack of capacity as the market has failed. The Legal Aid Agency had to go out to tender three times in the last year because it simply did not receive enough uh, expressions of interest from potential legal aid providers. We've heard how lack of early legal help has left people without assistance, literally leaving them with no income, no home, no ability to resolve their immigration status. The debate, the speakers on the Windrush scandal have shown what happens when people are denied independent legal advice. It leads to the obscenity of people left in limbo and excluded from their own homes. Previously, I've campaigned for Labour and I've had to say people should vote for us because we're not as bad as the Tories. Today, I'm proud to say that Labour has a programme which will build on our traditions of solidarity and transform society. A proposal which reimagines what justice could look like with education so that people know their rights, with community-based services developing good quality jobs for people with lived experience of the problems that need tackling, creating local face-to-face -face services which provide the help which people really need to exercise those rights. This will make sure that bad employers and poor landlords don't continue to get away with it. It will also make sure that systemic poor decision-making by state so again, agencies such, such as the DWP is tackled and made fit for purpose. It will put money back into the pockets of those on the lowest incomes and regenerate communities from the grassroots. Our policies will make justice for all a reality, tackling the imbalance of power so to again, benefit the many, not the few. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a point of order and then we're going to be wrapping up this debate point. Yeah. If you've got a point of order, you can make it. My point I wanted to make here, people always say Muslim women don't want to integrate. There is less than five people who are wearing hijab. And we were asking you to take the part of the debate. You didn't give us opportunity. I am very sorry, and okay. that is not the party I am a member of. Okay, thank you for your contribution. We've got another several points of order. If your points of order that you didn't like, that I didn't choose you, I can only apologize, but it's not really a valid point of order. Um, I appreciate, and you go. Um, Thank you very much. Um, just a small point of order and a reminder to all delegates here 
uh, to be respectful, especially to the chair. It's a very emotive, very broad debate, and they're doing it in good faith. And there's lots of people here. And if you haven't got picked, like I haven't got picked, that's, that's the way it is. I'm sure they're doing it in great faith. And thank you for chairing this debate in such a comradely way. If anyone else wants to make a point of order like that, they're more than welcome. Can you accept that? Point? <laughs> I do accept that point of order. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. You have a hard job. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll find a better system for next year. Um, I'm Celine uh, Rich Darley from Amersham and Chesham. And I would just like to request that we postpone the um, vote on the proposal to refer back um, NFP report page 51, please, because no one's had a chance to speak on it. So there's been no debate on it whatsoever, right. and no one's voiced their Perfect. opinion. And I'm glad to wait for my turn uh, to okay. speak on it. But um, if we could wait till other people have had a chance to speak, thank you. Okay, thank you. As I come back on that point of order, we can't postpone. I appreciate that more people want to speak, but it is tabled and can be postponed. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, this is my first conference, and whilst the experience has been inspirational so far, but the method by, you know, by which we're actually choosing speakers is actually quite disappointing. Um, for a small town like mine, St. Helens, we might never get represented. You know, I actually think CLPs should be asked to put forward names of their speakers so that every CLP can be represented here. That's why. Thank thought. you very much. There is, I couldn't agree more with all the speakers who have, have more option, would like to suggest more options. Can I suggest that you involve yourselves in the CAC, the Conference Arrangements Committee, who elect delegates from the CLPs. It's a great way to shape conference um, and consider even putting yourself forward for any C elections. There's loads of ways to democratically involve yourself in this party and we need more people voicing opinions to run the, make conference be more democratic and open. So I appreciate that those contributions. I am now going to move from the debate to hear from our next amazing speaker. I'm pleased to ask Diane Abbott to reply to the debate, but before Diane speaks, we have a video. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Conference. It's great to be back in Liverpool. This party is now the largest social democratic party in Europe, and we are still growing. I'm still here. Jeremy Corbyn is. And Jeremy Corbyn is emphatically still here as leader of the Labour Party. We are here to discuss the safety and security of the whole country. And this, like so many social issues, is a collective endeavour. 
It cannot be done individually. You are not safe, if your neighbour isn't safe, and we know who suffers most from crime. It's the most vulnerable, women, the elderly, children, all of our ethnic minority communities, the LGBTQ community and disabled people. So it has always been wrong to say that law and order is somehow a Tory issue. Fighting crime and upholding the law are key issues for our communities and are therefore key issues for Labour. The truth is that the Tories are all talk when it comes to law and order. In fact, they've cut over 20,000 police officers. Support staff have been decimated and we can all see the consequences in our community. Response times to 99 calls are increasing. Violent crime is increasing, but arrests are falling. Government cuts, Tory austerity, has damaged our public services. All Tory cuts have consequences. And their police cuts also have consequences. You cannot keep people safe on the cheap. In Labour's 2017 manifesto, the brilliant 2017 manifesto, we said we would add 10,000 police officers. We will focus on rebuilding community policing because community police are the front line against crime, including terrorism. We also intend to recruit more fire officers, more border guards. The next manifesto is not yet written, but obviously I'll be having friendly chats with the Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell about the money available for home affairs and security, but I'm sure that we're all agreed where we want the money available to recruit police and fire officers and border guards to go. But on a serious note, the tragic fire at Grenfell reminds us all of the courage of our firefighters. But this government refuses to accept that their cuts to fire services cause longer response times. They refuse to accept that privatisation and deregulation led inevitably to disasters like Grenfell. More than a year later, they have not produced a single initiative that would prevent a repeat of Grenfell. That is how much they care. This government is failing to protect communities or to ensure their safety. This government is big on rhetoric about security, policing and borders, but talk is cheap. Action costs money. They've slashed the border guards just as they slashed the police and fire services. Not Labour. It wasn't Labour that slashed the border guards. It was the Tories that made those cuts. Real border security to stop drug trafficking, sex traffickers, gangsters and terrorists, that is what the Labour Party stands for. But false and toxic rhetoric on protecting our borders and on immigration led directly to the Windrush scandal.
Can you imagine living in a country which indefinitely detains its own citizens, which deports them, which refuses them cancer treatment, even when they've lived in the country all their adult lives? Well, under this government, we saw this happen to the Windrush generation. This was my parents' generation, and I know full well that this was a generation that came to help rebuild this country after the war, and the Tories treated them like this. This was a generation who was so proud to be British, which makes the way they were treated even more shameful. So we've had Theresa May with her go home fans. She was the Home Secretary who announced that she would deport first, appeal later, and the entire Tory party and the Lib Dems voted for the 2014 Immigration Act, which implemented their hostile environment. They are responsible for Windrush. And it's no use. <laughs> and it's no use the current Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, trying to evade responsibility. He claims to have ended the hostile environment. That is untrue. Last Friday, he sneaked out an announcement showing that they are still treating the Windrush generation as second-class citizens. We will not rest until there is justice for the Windrush generation. We will not rest until the hostile environment is ended, until Yards, Wood and Brook House detention centres are closed. <laughs> and we won't rest until this Prime Minister and this government is gone. Recently, I set out Labour's new immigration policy. It's based on Labour values and the needs of the society. It is not based on demonising migrants. We will always uphold our legal and moral obligations to Commonwealth citizens. We will not use the three million EU citizens currently resident here as bargaining chips. We We will uphold their rights and the rights of British citizens resident in Europe. We'll be striking deals with the EU and other countries. These trade deals can benefit us all. Migration may well be part of those deals. And the immigration that I have set out fits into that, not the other way around. What we won't be doing is having bogus numerical targets for immigrants. the Home Affairs Select Committee, the Migration Advisory Committee, and a former Home Office Permanent Secretary have all said that these bogus numerical targets do not work. I think the only person that still believes in them is Theresa May. Instead of bogus targets and demonising migrants, we will have clear criteria after the Brexit deal, after the trade deals, we may still have key skills gaps, such as the shortages of doctors and nurses and social care workers. So first of all, we'll increase training and education and apprenticeships for people here and insist that companies do the same. We will drive up wages by enforcing the national minimum wage and we will increase employee rights and clamp down on exploitation. But we can't expect increased training to plug the shortage of workers like doctors and social care workers in the short term. We will need some migrant workers. But conference, we should always remember that immigrants don't drive down wages. It's predatory employees.
predatory employers, weakened trade union rights and freedoms, and an austerity government. That is what has driven down wages. And once people are here, we will treat our brothers and sisters from overseas fairly and equally. That is Labour's new immigration policy. But I can't go without reminding this audience here in Liverpool that Labour is committed to releasing all the papers in relation to the 37 Camel Laird Shiplard workers and the Shrewsbury 24 trial. We will provide full disclosure. We want justice and we'll have open inquiries into all grief and into the blacklisting. <laughs> and inquiries into the blacklisting of trade unionists. When When workers are engaged in legitimate disputes, they need to be safe and secure from intimidation, from threats, and from media frame-ups. Now, most of you will have heard of the spy cop scandal. We know that in this country, you generally need a warrant to enter someone's home or intercept their telephone calls. So a Labour government will insist on time-limited judicial warrants for any undercover policing. And I couldn't let my conference speech end without thanking my fantastic Shadow Home Affairs team, Nick Thomas-Simmons, Afsar Khan, Karen Lee, Louise Haig, and Eleanor Smith. They have been brilliant. They are formidable in holding the Tories to account and will be formidable in government. But I also want to thank all of you who've supported our party, supported me, and supported the leader, Jeremy Corbyn, through thick and thin. <laughs> this country has never needed a Labour government more. We will have to repair the ravages of the Tory years. This country needs a Jeremy Corbyn-led Labour government. And as one of our former leaders, the great John Smith said, the chance to serve is all we ask. Thank you, Compton.
<laughs> Thank you. Conference. We are now going to take the votes on today's business. Oh, and we've got a point of order first. No, I'm going to take the point of order if it's on the votes. Allow us to rearrange ourselves. Excuse me. Chair, when I moved reference back of the section on climate change this morning, uh, I asked the Commission for a commitment to convene a meeting of frontline constituencies in the fracking campaign. Uh, I, it wasn't a rhetorical question, I was hoping for an answer. Now, I don't expect you to answer now, but I would like an assurance that I would get an answer tomorrow. Okay. We don't have a reply for you yet, but we know that they have heard what you say, and I think that's, all, that's the only guarantee that I can, can give you at this point. But continue to pursue. Um, so, we'll now take the votes on today's business. Um, there are a large number of votes, and to help delegates as we go through, we will be displaying the document or motion, hopefully, you are voting on on the screen behind me, fingers crossed. We'll take votes by a show of hands. Any that are unclear, we will take separate votes of CLP affiliate and affiliate delegates. If that is not clear, we will take card votes. The votes on the rule changes will be card votes as listed in CAC Report 1. CAC 3. Oh, sorry. CAC Report 3. Good start. Firstly, on this morning's business. Contemporary Composite 5 on Brexit moved by the GMB can I firstly see all those in favour of that composite? All those against? That motion is carried. <laughs> Contemporary composite six on government contracts moved by Unisim. Can I see all those in favour? All those against? That motion is carried. <laughs> Contemporary Composite 7 on government contracts moved by the FBU. So that's 7 versus 6, the previous one was 6. All those in favour? All those against? That motion is carried. The reference back of the page 51 of the MPF report, section on climate change, renewables and low carbon energy, moved back by Thirsk and Malton CLP. All those in favour of the reference back, please show. Okay. All those against the reference back? I think that's carried. Okay. The Environment, Energy and Climate Change Policy Commission annual report, as amended by the reference back, all those in favour of accepting the, the, the report, all those against, that report is accepted, flash carried. Next, this afternoon's business. Contemporary Composite 8 on the Justice for Windrush, moved by Lewisham Deptford CLP. Can I see all those in favour of that composite? All those against? I think that is carried unanimously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Contemporary Composite 9 on Palestine, moved by Harlow CLP. Can I see all those in favour? All those against? That motion is carried. Thanks, delegates. The reference back of page 117, section on electoral constitutional reform, yep, electoral constitutional reform, sorry, sentence five of the MPF report, moved by Beckenham CLP. All those in favour of the reference back? 
Okay, all those against? That's kind of hard to Oh no, I'm sweating. Okay, so that's fine. Okay, firstly, we're just going to take the CLP delegates. Can I see all CLP delegates who are in favour of. Oh. The reference back, Justice, you're going to need to look at the documentation because I don't have, I can't so show that. It was what was moved. Yes. Yeah, it's voter ID, exactly. So this is Justice and Home Affairs a report, page 117. I can give everyone a second to find it and read it if you want. Section on electoral and constitutional reform. Everyone's yelling no at me because you want to go. That's fair enough, me too. Um, so this is the it is on electoral reform. It's, I think it was the one that was moved by Beckenham at the beginning of this session. So, CLP delegates, can I see all those CLP delegates who are in favour of the reference back? Okay, all those CLP delegates who are, in f who are against the reference back, sorry. Okay, and now the affiliate, uh, affiliate delegates, can I see all those in favour of the reference back? And against the reference back. The reference back's carried. Reference back is carried. Okay. This was the second reference back on that same topic, where the reference back is on page 117, the same page, the section, there's the whole section on electoral constitutional reform, and page 104, the sentence beginning, the commission then had. This was moved by Hastings and Rye CLP. Is that clear? All those in favour of the reference back. All those against. I'm going to split it. I'm going to, I'm going to take that in two sections. I think it was unclear. Firstly, I want to take the CLP delegates. So that can the CLP delegates who are in favour of the reference back please show? The CLP delegates who are against the reference back. The affiliate delegates who are in favour of the reference back. The, the affiliate delegates did I say it? Yeah, who are against the reference back. That, that reference back falls. Okay. The Justice and Home Affairs Policy Commission annual report. Is that amended? As amended. As amended by the reference back, yep. Yeah. All those in favour of accepting the report. All those against? That's carried. The International Policy Commission annual report. All those in favour? All those against? That is also carried. Thank you. We will now take the card votes on the rule changes. Yes, on you go. <clears throat> Point of orders are a glorious part of democracy and we should celebrate them. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to clarify because it has been misrepresented by some sections of the media in, in terms of the debate that we had about gender representation amongst our leadership, that although the Wirral motion, card vote 15, has been withdrawn, card vote 16 on the same issue has not we have not withdrawn that motion and we do urge you to vote for it thank you thanks. very much thanks delia that is i was probably too generous with that part, point of order um card vote 16 is is on the page so that should be pretty clear for everyone to see so we're now going to take card votes on the rule changes a number of these rule changes were remitted or withdrawn there are only five card votes remaining you cannot make a point of order to explain why you've remitted or withdrawn. That is not a point of order. So these votes are that have not been um, remitted or withdrawn. Card vote 10 on membership of other parties. Card vote 13 on annual conference standing orders. Card vote 14 on constitutional amendments. Card vote 16 on election method for deputy leader. Card vote 22 on Westminster selections and CLP right not to field a candidate. The card votes 
and the NEC recommendations are in CAC Report 3 and are on the screen, are on the screen behind me. Please remain in your seats while the votes are being taken. Are the tailors in possession? Can delegates make sure to hold their voting cards up so they can be collected and please stay in your seats even if you've voted because it just causes so much, makes this whole process go so much more quickly. We're so close to being done.
If delegates are choosing to leave, I'm not waiting for the formal dismissal that I was very looking forward to, to giving to the room. Um, please, can you leave? I know. Please, can you leave as quick as possible, just so that we can we can see people who haven't voted yet. Let's just make sure that every vote does get counted. The calls are going out. Any more for any more? There's people indicating over here. Card votes. I don't know if there's a teller that's near. I see. Okay, I think almost every one's vote is cast. Please don't leave the room with your vote. Please do make sure and find the teller if you haven't yet voted. The, the folk with the, the large boxes. But in lieu of most people having voted, I'd like com to formally adjourn conference and conference will reconvene at 9am tomorrow morning. Thank you, everybody.